Hi, this is a Alt Shift X live stream to talk about the season finale of House of the Dragon, episode 10, The Black Queen. We're going to talk all about the episode, we're going to answer your questions, we are not going to spoil future episodes. And after this live stream, there's going to be a shorter explained video later on. What did you think of the episode? What did you think of the season finale? The previous episode focused on the Greens, on Alicent's family, as they crowned Aegon as king. And this episode focuses on Rhaenyra's family, as Rhaenyra is crowned queen, setting up the big conflict between these two sides for the Iron Throne. And we had our first royal casualty in this war. We had the death of Rhaenyra's son, Lucerys Velaryon, and his dragon, Arax, killed by the monstrous Vega and Aemon Targaryen. And it included a very surprising change from the books here. Because here in the show, Aemon didn't mean to kill Arax and Lucerys. Vega just did it, like Amond was not fully in control of his dragon, and Amond was like, oh no, oops, I killed a prince, this is really bad, but he didn't like mean to do it. That's an interesting change. We also had Rhaenyra giving birth to a stillborn baby, a daughter named Visenya in the books at least, and that was sad, that was tragic. Rhaenyra lost a lot this episode, and when she finds out about the death of her son at the end of this episode, uh, she gives us a classic uh, Targaryen vengeful look. Is it just me, or does that look just like Daenerys in, uh, in Season 8, when Daenerys lost Missandei? And Daenerys had this moment of being like, okay, I'm a villain now. I got, I got, we got, we got some very similar looks from Daenerys in Game of Thrones. So it is ominous. <laughs> it is ominous to see a similar look from Rhaenyra. What it, what's going to follow from her? We also had, yeah, the return of the sea snake, Corlys Velaryon, the Lord of Driftmark. There was a whole succession crisis fought in Corlys's absence recently. Um, it was, it was thought that Corlys might die of a fever after a wound he took, but Corlys is back, and we had a nice scene with Rhaenys and Corlys talking about his ambitions and their political attitude, and Corlys was saying that, uh, you know, you know what, you're right, you're correct, like, I have been too determined to get thrown, I've been too power hungry, that has gotten a bunch of our family killed, so let's just chill, let's just retire to high tide and just be with our grandchildren and just chill. But then Rhaenys was like, no, you idiot, like, it's too late, like, there's a war now and Rhaenyra is the best hope at some kind of peace and justice, and the, the best way to protect our grandchildren at this point is to participate in this war, you idiot is kind of what Rangini says. She's nicer about it. So that was interesting. Um, and we had Rhaenyra's coronation, her sort of impromptu coronation. I, I thought it was a really nice contrast how in the previous episode, when the Greens were crowning Aegon, it was like this huge event that they had planned and they did all this conniving and running around and lying and cheating and stealing in order to get Aegon to the coronation. And they have the huge crowd and they have the septon and they have the sword and they have all the things. Um, and it's all sort of fake and corrupt last episode. But in this episode, the coronation of Rhaenyra is just sort of this natural impromptu thing that happens like at the cremation of her stillborn daughter. And it's this moment of grief that sort of just turns into her coronation because Eric Cargill turns up. He stole Viserys's crown from the Greens and he defected from the Greens and came to support Rhaenyra and brought the crown. And so they have this impromptu coronation that just happens naturally and everyone kneels to her. And it's this very different situation compared to the Greens' coronation of Aegon. Um, just to, just seeing, like, Rhaenyra's leadership style is interesting, comparing that to Aegon. I mean, Aegon, 
Aegon, Alicent's son, doesn't really have much of a leadership style at all. He he has no interest in being a leader. But Rhaenyra is actually trying to be a politician, and she has quite a like like I think we see a lot of her sort of uncertainty. I mean, look at her look at her, the way she's holding her hands here. There's a lot of hand acting in House of the Dragon. Like Alicent is the most prominent, but there are many many characters who. Um, show their anxiety by sort of wringing their hands all the time. And we see that vulnerability in Rhaenyra. An- another surprising moment uh, was Daemon choking Rhaenyra. A lot of people upset about this bit. Um, it's it's pretty consistent with what we've seen of Daemon so far, I think. Um, Daemon has always been a violent person. Uh, Daemon killed his previous wife with a rock, Rhea Royce. Um, Daemon, I mean, the f- in the first episode, Daemon, like, assaults all of those common people and takes great joy in mutilating these random peasants who supposedly are criminals. Um... Daemon, you know, takes great joy in war. Daemon, like, beat that messenger really badly, this innocent messenger, just because he didn't like the message. Like, whenever Daemon is upset, whenever he feels insecure, he hurts people, innocent people. And and in this episode, that includes Rhaenyra. So, Daemon's not a good person. <laughs> Daemon's horrible. Daemon's violent and cruel. And, um... It's going to be really difficult for Rhaenyra dealing with him. In this episode, Daemon is really keen for war. Daemon is very keen to go fly the dragons and rally the soldiers and shed some blood to take the throne. Partly, I think, that's like his grief and anger over the death of Viserys and, you know, anger at the injustice of Alicent and Aegon taking the throne. I mean, it's funny that Aegon's, um, Daemon's immediate reaction when he finds out that Aegon has taken the throne, he says, that whore of a queen murdered my brother and stole his throne. And it's not true that, you know, Alicent didn't murder Viserys, but that's the first thing Daemon goes to because he doesn't know how to feel grief But he does know how to feel anger, and he does know how to do violent vengeance, so that is the emotion that he turns to. Whereas Rhaenyra, you know, the the shock uh, and anger of finding out, and the grief of finding out that Viserys is dead and her throne has been stolen, that shock induces a early labor for her, and leads to this horrible um, birth of the stillborn baby and and that whole situation, but, you know, she has this totally opposite reaction uh, to Daemon, and while Rhaenyra is, like, screaming through the halls, and, like, everyone in the War Council can hear her screaming, Daemon is just ignoring her and focusing on the war that he's trying to start. He ignores his his wife in her dangerous labour and focuses on the war that he wants to start. It's- that bit is also quite different in the books. In the books, uh, Rhaenyra's labor here lasts for days, and Rhaenyra is not only like screaming; she's she's screaming. She's screaming in anger at Alicent as well. Like in the books, uh, Rhaenyra says, um, "Where's the description?" She's saying that like she's she, she's screaming curses against Alicent, and she's like swearing to get a revenge on Alicent um, while she's giving birth. Um, just like Alicent was made more sort of, you know, wanting peace in the previous episode, Rhaenyra also is changed in this episode compared to the books to be more peaceful. They're, they're, they're definitely, like, emphasizing this idea in the show that, you know, Alicent and Rhaenyra mostly just want everyone to get along. It's all these, like, power-hungry men who, with all of their ambition and their desire for war that are pushing this conflict. Whereas in the book, at least so far... Alicent and Rhaenyra are, like, both equally keen for conflict, mostly, as it's described in the books. I think we might see that change. Like, I think that in the show, we're starting with a more peaceful Alicent and Rhaenyra, and I imagine we might see them become more extreme as they go on. And I think and I think we saw that with Rhaenyra's face at the end of this episode. I, th- I think, you know, Rhaenyra might not be quite as eager for peace now that her son has been killed. Anyway, let's answer some of your questions. Thanks for the super chat from Nelly, who says, We finally got to see Storm's End. 
Yeah, I was really happy with how they did Storm's End. Um, So Storm's End is the castle of House Baratheon. We've seen Stannis hang out here um, and Daenerys hang out here in the original Game of Thrones show. We've never seen the exterior... Well, no, sorry. Yeah, that's that's Dragonstone. Storm's End we have never seen in Game of Thrones. Um, We saw, like, outside of Storm's End. But this is the first time that we're properly seeing Storm's End in any of the shows. And and it's quite faithful to how it's described in the books. Like, it, it describes this big, giant, like, central tower in the castle, like, thrust up towards the sky. And it's sort of symbolically a big middle finger to God, because Storm's End was built in, in like, defiance of the storm gods who kept tearing down um, the, the castle of uh, uh, the defiant... Durin God's Grief. Yeah, Durin God's Grief kept rebuilding his castles. And so, you know, the fact that his castle is still standing, even after the gods kept trying to tear it down, it's like this act of defiance. And I really like how it looks. They have they have made it that, like, it, it's almost on, like, a little island that's just out thrust from the land, surrounded by sea, which is reminiscent of Pike, the uh, Greyjoy castle. Yeah, like, Lucerus arrived in Storm's End, and I loved the shot where he arrives, and then he's like, oh no, goddamn Beleriand the Black... goddamn Vega is there, the largest living dragon. Uh, and I think that the terror of that moment was really well captured by Vega, like, coming into view with the thunder and the storm clouds. That was that was very well done. And Lucerus really should have, like, you know, turned 360 degrees and walked walked out of there. Uh, is what he should have done, but he bravely continued to deliver his message from Rhaenyra, trying to get Lord Baratheon's support, but he finds that Aemond is already there. Aemond and the Greens had the same idea, so they already arrived to say, hey, Boros Baratheon, you should side with us. And the irony of this is that Rhaenyra sent Luke to Storm's End because she thought that Storm's End and Lord Boros Baratheon would be the easy task. She sent uh, her elder son, Jace, uh, to go to the Eyrie and then to Winterfell to try and get the support of the Arons and the Starks. Um, but then Luke, she was like, well, we'll give you the easy job because Storm's End is nearby and we're pretty sure the Baratheons will support us. It, it won't be a problem. But they're wrong. Because the thing is, um, Boromond Baratheon was the previous lord of Storm's End. This guy. This is Boromond Baratheon. And he... We saw him in episode one saying, hey, uh, Rhaenys Targaryen, you're really cool, because, like, he is the uncle of Rhaenys Targaryen. Um, And so the Baratheons, or at least Boromir Baratheon, has always been, like, friendly with Rhaenys and with the Blacks in general. We saw Boromir again uh, in episode four. But Rhaenyra made the mistake, like, now that Boromir is dead and his son Boros has taken over... Rhaenyra wrongly assumed that Boros would also be friendly, but Boros is not. In the books, it's partly about gender with Boros. Like, in the books, Boros is like, yeah, well, you know, like, you know, maybe Rhaenyra was supposedly the heir at some point, but Aegon is a son, and, you know, sons are better than daughters, and, you know, the sons are the rightful heirs, so it's partly because Aegon is a son that Boros decides to support him. But also, it's a marriage pact. So, like, they mention it in the episode that Aemon is going to marry one of Boros's daughters. It's, li- it's a little bit like, you know, uh, Rob promises to marry one of Lord Walder Frey's daughters in Game of Thrones. So Aemon is like, yeah, I'll, I'll marry one of your daughters. And in the books, it that's like a whole thing. Like, we see some of the daughters in this episode. There's like four Baratheon daughters. We, we see Aemon like talking to one of them. So it looks like this is the daughter that Aemon has chosen to marry. Um, but in the books, it says that Aemon is offered four, four daughters and he gets to choose which daughter he wants to marry. Uh, and Aemon kisses each of Boros Baratheon's daughters in turn because he wants to try before he buys. <laughs> There's some even more gross line in the book about like he he wanted to taste the nectar of each daughter's kiss before he chose which one he wanted to marry. But anyway, like, you know, because Aemond, like, you know, Prince Aemond Targaryen is offering to marry one of his daughters, that's another reason why Boros decides to side with the Greens instead of with Rhaenyra. The book says that, like, while uh, Lord Boromond Baratheon 
was like very like reliable and and consistent boros was like as wild and changeable as the storm boros is like more fickle than boromond and um that's part of why he you know takes a different side as well but another detail that's different in the books is that like in 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 the show like amon says hey luke you cut out my eye so i'm gonna force you to give me one of your eyes which i'm pretty sure is um pretty sure that's a line from it's always sunny but um but Amon is saying, like, you owe me an eye, and then Boros is like, I don't want you guys to fight in my hall, so get out of here. Like, I don't want I don't want this to happen in my hall, so they go outside, and then Amon pursues on Vega. But in the books, Amon almost didn't go after Luke, but then one of uh the daughters of Boros Baratheon uh insulted Amond. One of one of Boros's daughters said, Hey, Amond. Did that kid take one of your eyes, or did he take one of your balls, you wuss? Like, the the daughter calls Amond a wuss, and so Amond basically gets, like, bullied uh, and insulted. And because his pride is wounded, he then goes after Luke. So it's interesting that there was, like, you know, there, there were other people involved in Amond's decision to go after Luke. But yeah, it is really interesting that, you know, after this pursuit... Um, both Luke and Aemon struggle to control their dragons. Like, we, we hear them saying the commands. Um, and then... And then Aemon and Luke are both shocked when their dragons don't follow their orders because Arax shoots flame at Vega without Luke's wanting him to. Um, and then Vega kills Arax and Luke. Um... And they're both shouting no the whole time. And that's a really interesting and surprising change. The failure to control the dragon. I mean, you know, it, it does have precedent because, like, you know, Daenerys struggles to control Drogon in both the show and the book, especially in the book. I, I mean, something to keep in mind is that, like, the, the, the whole, like, dragon controlling uh, infrastructure is, is gone since Valyria blew up. Like, in the books, they mention that the ancient Valyrians had, like, dragon horns that they could use, like magic dragon horns that could bind dragons to their will, and that was something that they used to control dragons better. Um, there's a lot more knowledge about dragons that has been lost. And also there's the fact that, you know, Amond and Luke are very young. They're just kids. They haven't got enough uh, Pokemon gym badges in order to control their dragons. Like, Vagar is this ancient giant monster. She is so much more powerful. I don't know if Amond has, like, the willpower and the experience to control Vagar properly. And there's lots of questions about the sort of potential psychic link between a dragon and the rider. Like, does the dragon sense the rider's desires uh, and and interpret how to behave? Um, does the dragon's personality affect the rider's personality? Like, does the warlike, powerful, angry energy of Vega affect Amon's decision making? And what does Amon do afterwards? Like, so something that the kosher runner Ryan Condal hinted at in the inside the episode is that you know Amond has now accidentally killed Lucerus and now he has the choice of like when he comes home to King's Landing and says um so here's the thing um mum um I killed a prince whoops it was an accident I didn't want to whoops sorry is he going to do that, or is he going to say, hey, I'm a badass, and I decided to kill Luke because this is a war, and we've got to win, and I'm so badass, you know? And I think the implication is that Amond is going to is gonna do the latter. He's going to claim that he did it deliberately. Um, and that sort of fits with what the books say, kind of. Because, like, the books are written by the historians. The book, Fire and Blood, the, the, the maesters don't really know exactly what happened, um, like, it's described in the book that, you know, the people on the ground in Storm's End, like, they saw, like, a burst of fire in the storm clouds above, and, like, they saw that something was happening, but they didn't know exactly what happened. They certainly don't know the details of, like, you know, whether Amon did this on purpose or not. 
But if Amon says that, yeah, I did this deliberately, then that's what the history books will think. Um, and so it's sort of like, you know, is Amon really a villainous monster? Or does he just sort of become a villainous monster because he seems that way? Like, because he claims responsibility for killing Luke, he has to act like a bad guy now. I mean, remember that kinslaying is really bad. Like, killing your relatives is considered one of the most evil crimes in this world. Um, and Luke is Amon's nephew, or half-nephew. So, he is now Amon the Kinslayer. So, it's like, you know, it kind of forces him into a villainous role, I think. Um, we also saw something interesting, which was Daemon coming and visiting the dragon Vermithor. This is the first time we've seen the dragon Vermithor. And Vermithor was the dragon of King Jaehaerys, who was the king before Viserys. Uh, this fella, his dragon was Vermithor. So Vermithor is one of the uh, biggest and oldest dragons. Not as big or old as Vega, but certainly a powerful dragon. And we had this whole dragon discussion at Daemon's War Council where they were counting... Um, they were counting which dragon... Like, which side has the most dragons. Um, and basically the situation is that the Greens, Aegon and Alicent, they have more... They have bigger armies, they have stronger allies with, like, uh, the High Towers and the Reach and the Tyrells, um, and the Lannisters are on their side. Um, so they've got more soldiers, but the Blacks, Rhaenyra's side, have more dragons. Like, the Greens, Aemond has Vega, which is the most powerful dragon, and they also have Aegon's dragon Sunfire and Helena's dragon Dreamfire, but the Blacks... Like, Rhaenyra has a dragon, Daemon has a dragon, Rhaenys has a dragon, Jace, Luke, R.I.P. Luke, and Bela have dragons, and then there's these wild dragons. So they mentioned that there's, like, Vermithor, Jaehaerys' old dragon, then there's Silverwing, which was the dragon of Jaehaerys' queen, Alysanne, and there's also Seasmoke, who is Laenor's dragon, and it remains to be seen if Seasmoke can even be claimed by anyone else, since Laenor is secretly still alive. And, and Daemon also mentions that there are wild dragons on Dragonstone. There's a few of those. Um, and, you know, there's also, like, you know, the books mention that uh, Aegon and Helena's ch children, young children, have hatchlings. And there's several other dragons that will appear later. So, so you know, there's a, there's a few dragons, but the point is that the Blacks have more dragons, whereas the Greens have a bigger army. So there's this whole sort of tactical, strategic discussion of how do we leverage this advantage. And we had one of the lords at the council saying, hey, like, let's just use the dragons. Let's go to King's Landing and burn them and defeat the Greens right now. And Daenerys said, well, I don't want to be the queen of ashes and bone. Uh, when you use dragons, innocent people die, as we saw in the previous episode with Rhaenys and Melis. And this mirrors the issues that Daenerys had in Game of Thrones Season 7 and 8 when... When Daenerys was like, I, I want to attack King's Landing with dragons, and Tyrion was saying, you probably shouldn't do that because lots of innocent people will die. So, uh, Rhaenyra is facing a similar issue, um, and she's trying not to kill too many innocent people. And Daemon also made the point that, like, with, with dragons, it's really hard for just a human to kill a dragon. Like, you can get lucky with a scorpion bolt or an arrow, um, but dragons are mostly mostly impervious to, like, most human weapons. The best way to kill a dragon is with another dragon. And so, the Blacks are worried about Vega. Like, like the most powerful dragons on the... on Rhaenyra's side are, you know, probably Caraxes is probably number one, and then, like, Cyrax and Melis. Uh, but Vega is stronger than any of them. So, there's gonna be... there's a lot of uh, concern about potential dragon battles here, and potentially recruit... like, getting some riders for these unclaimed dragons to try and get even more of an advantage. Silver says, In your vids, it's maybe more appropriate to say, this is different from the book, instead of, this is a change from the book, as the show deals with the idea that history books may not reflect reality, says Silver. Um... Yeah. Yeah. What well, one of the other chain one of the other uh, differences from the book is how they did something with Orwile in the books that I enjoyed. In the books like we have this peace offering 
that Otto brings from Alison saying, hey, Rhaenyra, let's not have a war. You should just surrender and then everything will be cool beans. And I thought it was funny that um, Otto offers a different peace deal than what Alison told him to in the previous episode. Like, remember there was that whole thing last episode about, like, capturing... Aegon so that the so that Alicent could set the terms and Alicent was like we are not going to kill Rhaenyra we're going to offer her decent peace uh d- decent peace terms that she can accept without shame and Alicent says like you know Rhaenyra must not return Alicent said and so the implication of Alicent's words was that she was going to suggest for Rhaenyra to be exiled for Rhaenyra to leave and go to the east because you know that's kind of the only place to go from Westeros um and so it's weird to me that Otto in this episode said oh no we're gonna like make uh we're gonna confirm you guys can have Dragonstone what was his exact wording he said that like (sighs) yeah he he said that your son's with Daemon Viserys and Aegon can be given places at court. Lucerus will be the heir to Driftmark. Yeah, your possession of Dragonstone. Yeah, so it's interesting to me that in this episode, Otto said, you can stay at Dragonstone. Whereas in the previous episode, Alicent was saying, Rhaenyra should, like, leave. Is is the implication. I don't know, like, given that, that, that so much of last episode was about Alicent trying to set the terms of the peace deal, it's weird to me that Otto sort of offers a different peace deal than what Alicent was saying. It, it seems like Alicent should have come personally. Like, we have Otto give Rhaenyra this page that he tore out of that book about Nymeria. Like, remember previously when Alicent and Rhaenyra were in the godswood reading that book and then Rhaenyra tore the page out of the book and it's sort of this symbol of like ooh Rhaenyra is so rebellious but Alicent gives that page back to Rhaenyra now as a way of saying hey like remember when we were friends when we were kids like let's be friends again let's make peace um which is a nice little symbol but it just makes me think why didn't Alicent come in person like I guess she's the queen she's a more you know they don't want to risk her or whatever but you know, since Alicent no longer trusts Otto, like, you know, Alicent said our hearts were never won. Why does Alicent trust Otto to deliver these terms? Why doesn't Alicent just go herself? Why doesn't she just, like, you know, why doesn't she just get Aegon to fly her to Dragonstone on Sunfire and and she and Aegon can present the terms? It's, we- it's weird to me Alicent's trust of Otto in this moment. Anyway, uh, thanks for the super chat from Prester, who says, Do you see Rhaenyra as being indecisive or passive, like her father Viserys? I mean, she, she was reluctant to take action at first in this moment. Like, all of the men were saying, let's prepare for war, and Rhaenyra was saying, let's not do anything just yet. I want to, like, suss out the situation. I want to talk to our potential allies. And, Ra- and Rhaenyra definitely was, like, embodying Viserys's legacy in this episode. Like, she was saying that, you know, my job is to keep unity, my job is to keep the peace. Um, and so, yeah, she was definitely consciously, like, vibing Viserys right now. And I wonder if that might change now that Luke is dead and now that Rhaenyra is angry. I think, I think that might possibly change. Um... And, you know, she's wearing Viserys' crown as well, which is like a visual symbol of, like, how she is imitating Viserys um, and Viserys' desire for peace. So, you know, we'll, we'll, see, if, we'll see if Rhaenyra manages to, to keep any kind of peace and unity. Uh, thanks for the donation from Fathers of Daughters, who says, Bradley of House Hines is the love of my life. Thanks, Father. Ethan says, please do a, more a cockabridged. The, that's a show on the Ultra of Dex YouTube channel. Daniel says, Love how the dragons are going to live up to their reputation as fantastical nukes that can't be controlled, no matter how many gym badges one has. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the key thing with the dragons is that previously, Viserys said that the idea that we control the dragons is an illusion. And he also suggests that dragons are what destroyed Valyria which is not what the books say exactly, but that's an interesting suggestion. But yeah, like Viserys told us in episode one that the dragons are hard to control. And I think that's especially true when 
they're, they're being ridden by children. <laughs> I mean, per- look, personally, I blame the parents for this whole situation. It was the parents who gave the kids swords and trained them to fight and told them to see each other as enemies. Like, letting the children have dragons at, at, the, at this tender young age is, is crazy. So it's not shocking that this disaster happened. One of the other details in the books is that it says that, you know, Luke Valerion uh, appears to have been killed by Amond and Vagar, but there are some legends among the common folk that apparently Lucerus actually secretly survived this attack and became a simple-minded fisher folk hanging out in a fishing village and lived to a ripe old age. Probably not true. Probably not true. I mean, there are several pieces of Luke falling from 5,000 feet right now, but um, there is a legend that Luke is is, uh, actually still alive. Thanks for the super chat from Ariel, who says that birth scene actually made me cringe and shed tears. Anyone who's had a baby can probably relate. Yeah, that was intense. That was visceral. There was a lot of emotions in that scene. Um... They described it in the inside the episode as Rhaenyra was at war with her body because this was a premature birth, this was a stillborn birth, this was not meant to happen. Um, and Rhaenyra has always had a complicated relationship like with her gender and, and feeling sort of frustrated by her body. I mean, remember earlier in the show, Rhaenyra said, I don't want to be trapped in a tower making babies all day. And yet this is Rhaenyra's sixth childbirth. Um... So, you know, she said she didn't want to be married. This is her second marriage that she's in. And, and so, like, s- somehow she she has been railroaded into this, you know, gender role that she was never quite wanting to have. But, yeah, she had this traumatic, intense birth scene. And um, the baby did not come out looking great. I, I don't, you know, I don't know exactly what it should look like a month premature. But in the books... It says that Rhaenyra's stillborn baby, the daughter called Visenya in the in the books, uh, this baby is a is scaly and has a tail. It's it's got like dragon features in the books, supposedly. Mushroom says that the baby comes out looking like a dragon, um, which is similar to Daenerys. Daenerys in Game of Thrones um, gives birth to a baby that she is told was all like rotted and dragony and full of grave worms so it's interesting that that happened again with Rhaenyra and like sometimes that you know sometimes that seems connected to magic like it was really interesting that you know Rhaenyra while she was um birthing this stillborn we got all these like tiny flashes of Cyrax's face like we, we saw these images of Rhaenyra's dragon flashing on screen while she was giving birth to this stillborn um which suggests that there's like a connection between like the the blood of the dragon that's in the Targaryens um, and the weird stillbirths that happen with them sometime. Uh, you could also connect it to Daemon, like, you know, maybe since, you know, Daemon's evil um, might be connected to the uh, dragon features, like the, the reproductive failure of their union. That's something that comes up sometimes in the books. But yeah, this is something that happens with Targaryen sometimes. Um, JS says, Daemon grabbing Rhaenyra was totally messed up and out of character. Why are the writers being so dull? Yeah, a lot of strong reactions to Daemon grabbing Rhaenyra. I, I think that it is consistent with what we've seen of Daemon. He has hurt a lot of innocent people when he feels emotional. Um, he, you know, killed his previous wife with a rock. I'm not. I, I don't think it's inconsistent for Daemon to hurt Rhaenyra. I, I think hurting people is his fucked up way of dealing with his emotions. Um, it was interesting the context of this moment, though, wasn't it? Because the what what sparked Daemon um, to attack Rhaenyra like that was that Rhaenyra brought up Aegon the Conqueror's dream. Because remember that Viserys told Rhaenyra that like, hey. There is a prophecy made by Aegon the Conqueror that the Targaryens must be in charge and must be leading a unified Westeros in order to defeat the White Walkers. And Rhaenyra assumed that Daemon knew this. Like, she just talked about, oh, you know, the Song of Ice and Fire. Like, don't you know about the Song of Ice and Fire? 
And Daemon was so angry that he, like, finds out that Rhaenyra knows this important thing that he doesn't, and that's part of why he chokes her. Um, so really interesting that Daemon, you know, Daemon didn't know that. And I think that it, it's it's the same as, like... Um, yeah, what did she say? She said, yeah, he never told you. It, it's the same as how Viserys never made Daemon Hand of the King. Like, Daemon was saying to Viserys, like, if you trust me and if you love me as your brother, you should make me Hand of the King. You should include me on the council. You should make me your heir. Like, that was Daemon's issue early in this season. Um, and now this is just another example to Daemon of like, oh, and also there was this big prophecy that Viserys never told me about. So that's another way that my brother didn't love me and my brother rejected me. That's how Daemon feels about it. Um, and yeah, I mean, I, I feel like Viserys maybe should have told Daemon about the prophecy. Maybe Daemon might have taken the prophecy seriously because we know that Daemon, you know, Daemon read all those uh, Valyria books in Pentos like, Daemon is really interested in Valyrian history and tradition, and, you know, he, he wore that, like, he did that tr traditional Valyrian wedding in, and outfit and ceremony with Rhaenyra. So, like, given that he's interested in, like, lore and history and Valyrian her uh, heritage, I think that Daemon would have been really interested in Aegon's prophecy. And since the prophecy is all about Targaryen unity, I don't know, maybe it would have been a good idea for Viserys to tell Daemon about the prophecy. But I mean, Daemon does also say in this scene, like Daemon says, my brother was a slave to his omens and portents. Anything to make his feckless reign appear to have purpose. So Daemon, is, da Daemon does know that Viserys has some interest in prophecy. Like, maybe uh, Daemon knew about Viserys' dream that he would have a son uh, that he was mentioned in the earlier seasons. Um, but Daemon didn't know about the Song of Ice and Fire prophecy in particular. Um, but yeah, it's interesting that Daemon is so negative about Viserys' prophecies. Maybe that's just his immediate reaction here. Uh, anyway, uh, thanks for the super chat from Boopington. Well, another thing I would say about the prophecy is that, you know, a big part of why Rhaenyra is constantly urging for peace and unity right now, a big part of why Rhaenyra is trying to prevent war right now is because she is mindful of that prophecy and she's mindful of that responsibility. And it's tied up with, you know, it's not just about Aegon and White Walkers, it's about her father Viserys and his grandfather Jaehaerys who had peaceful realms, wearing that particular golden crown, and she wants to continue that peaceful legacy. Thanks for the super chat from Boopington, who says, the only reason Amond didn't want Luke dead was because he wanted to carve out Luke's eye. Something tells me he was evil already. Well, yeah, I may have, pre I may have earlier overstated um, Amond. You know, a Amond is not a super innocent guy. He was threatening to cut out a child's eye uh, just before. So yeah, he was he was already a dick. But like, I think it's important that Amond. You know, Amond looks like a villain, right? Like Amond looks like a bad dude because he's got the scar and he's got the eye patch and he's a warrior and he's got a he's just got that face. You know, he looks like a baddie. Um, but he doesn't do anything evil up until now. Oh, well, and even, you know, even now, like, he didn't mean to kill Luke. Um, I mean, Daemon has murdered a lot of innocent people. Aemon has not murdered any innocent people, de like, deliberately. Like, the wor like some of the worst things that Aemon has done is, like, you know, I, I mean, you, you could blame Aemon for escalating the brawl with the other children, like in the fight where Aemon's eye was cut out when he was a kid. You could blame Aemon for escalating that conflict, but, you know, he didn't strike the first blow. Um, you also could say that Aemon, you know, when he made that speech at the Last Supper, when he said, you know, you strong boys are so strong, like he was deliberately trying to, you know... Uh, stir some shit up and create conflict then. But Aemond is not a killer. Not deliberately, anyway. Um, so, you know, he, he he's a dick. But, like, you could argue that he's, he's kind of right to be a dick in that, like, he had his eye cut out and he wants justice for that. He never got justice for his mutilation. And that's a, you know, that that is a very real grievance. So, you know, Aemond is not a good guy, but... I think that he has some understandable motivations and some understandable bitterness. 
And it's going to be really interesting in the next season, you know, what kind of person he is. Because now he's got to deal with, you know, he's a kinslayer now. As far as the world is concerned, he deliberately murdered his nephew. And that's going to be a, uh, it's going to be a whole issue. In the books, there's a character called Crow Food Umber. And he also has a stone in, in the place of his missing eye. In his empty eye socket, he keeps a bit of dragon glass. Crow's, crow's food umber, because the crows ate his eyeball. He was, like, lying wounded on a battlefield, and then a crow came along and ate his eyeball while he was, like, too wounded to stop it. But then he ate the crow? Yeah, no, yeah, no, 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 he didn't eat the crow. The crow ate his eyeball, and that's why he's called crow food. And then he keeps a chunk of obsidian in his eye socket. You know, pretty, pretty metal, pretty anime. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Corbin, who says, Do you think the intro for Season 2 will change to a more traditional Game of Thrones map overview? I feel like Westeros will have a lot of moving parts going forward. Yeah, so, I mean, for Season 1 we had this, like, bloodline family tree, which made some sense because the family tree was always changing. Like, we, like most of the characters in this show were born during this season. You know, all of Rhaenyra's children and um, Alicent's children and grandchildren. Like, Alicent became a grandmother in the course of this first season, which is a pretty unusual thing to happen uh, like this. Um, so, you know, since the family tree was constantly shifting, it, it kind of made sense to have this bloodline opening sequence. Um, and I don't think it's a spoiler to say that... Um, there will be fewer big time skips from now on in House of the Dragon. Um, so I, I agree with you that it it may make more sense to have a map overview. I mean, we had the painted table in this episode, which is the table made by Aegon the Conqueror of Westeros, and it seems to have like a like a it's got an, an RGB feature. <laughs> You know those, uh, you know those gamer keyboards that have all the the lights in the keyboard. That's what the painted table looks like to me. It's, uh, yeah. Um, and so yeah, it looks like you can like put a a candle inside the table, and it's like hollow or translucent, so that the table lights up. That's cool. I I guess the RGB broke in the time of Game of Thrones because it, it it doesn't have this feature in uh, when Stannis and Daenerys are using the painted table. But anyway, it's it, it's a glow in the dark table. Cool. Um, and yeah, I agree that the map might make sense uh, because like in this episode they talked about the um, they talked about the various lords of Westeros. So here's a little political map of Westeros for you. These are all the great lords of Westeros, the most powerful lords in Westeros. Uh, so we mentioned, uh, Rhaenyra told Jace, hey, get on your dragon, fly up to Jane Arryn. She's probably going to support the Blacks, Rhaenyra, uh, because Rhaenyra's mother was an Arryn, so their family, so she assumes that the Arryns will support them. And then Jace is going to fly up to the north and go talk to Cregan Stark, Lord Cregan Stark, who was a young man, and they're hoping that he's going to support them. Um, and they talk about, you know, Starks never break oaths, they're really reliable, they'll be great. Um, they don't really mention the Ironborn this episode, I don't think, um, but the Ironborn, I mean, th they might be relevant. They're currently led by Dalton Greyjoy, the Red Kraken, and he's like 16 years old, um, and he loves battle and bloodshed, that's why they call him the Red Kraken, um... So he's a he's a piece of work, and he might be useful because like th there's the whole ships thing, right? So like the the blacks have Corlys and the Valerions, who have the most powerful fleet in Westeros, um, and so the Greens are relying on like the Lannister fleet of ships, but the Lannister fleet is not as good as um, the Valerion fleet. Um, but, you know, the Ironborn also have a really powerful fleet, so they might be relevant there. Um, the Lord of the Reach is currently a baby <laughs> called Lionel Tyrell. I think his mother is ruling for him. Um, and you could argue that Lord Hobart Hightower is kind of more powerful than the Tyrells are in a lot of ways. And it's assumed that the Tyrells and the Hightowers will both be supportive of Aegon and the Greens. Um, the Martells and Dawn are... are might not be relevant because Dawn is not part of Westeros currently. Dawn has not been conquered and has not joined the rest of Westeros. Dawn does not respect the authority of the Iron Throne. Um, 
And yeah, the Baratheons, we, uh, Rhaenyra thought that the Baratheons would support her, but it now looks like the Baratheons are going to support uh, the Greens and Aegon. Grover Tully, they, they said something about like, um, Grover Tully is very like fickle and changeable, so we'll have to remind Grover of, of his loyalties, which, which is kind of different to how it's described in the books. So I I don't think I can say yet. Uh, I, I guess we'll learn more next season. But um, there's some cool stuff going on with Grover. And yes, Grover is named after a Muppet. And Grover has family members called Elmo and Kermit. Um, Sesame Street characters. Anyway, um, so yeah, that's a thing. Thanks for the super chat from Jack, who says, would love to see Jimmy Simpson in season two uh, with his eye patch. How do you feel about all the obvious repetitive dialogue and convos? I did feel like there was some repetition in this episode where they sort of kept saying the same things about like the war situation and wanting peace and that uh, yeah, I, I feel like there was some re repetitive dialogue in this episode. Thanks for the super chat from Nate who says in the books do the dragons show any sort of communication or relationships with each other? That's an interesting question. I mean, we, we we don't get to see much of that sort of thing. Because, like, in the time of the main Game of Thrones books, there's only three dragons. Uh, Drogon, Viserion, and Rhaegal. Um, and, yeah, I don't know. I mean, they describe the dragons, like, flying around with each other above Daenerys's ship. Um, they describe how, you know, like, Viserion and Rhaegal are locked underneath the Great Pyramid of Marine, while... Dro I mean, Drogon has his own sort of personality, where Drogon is, like, the more big, dangerous one, and Drogon is the one who flies around and eats children and such. Um, we, we don't see a whole lot of, like, interaction between the dragons. I mean, I guess, you know, there is the moment where uh, Viserion kills Quentin Martell in Book 5, and it sort of seems as though Rhaegal and Viserion are sort of closing in on him from either side, and it sort of looks like they're working together. But no, yeah, I, I can't think of examples of, like, personality interacting between the dragons in the books. Uh, I mean, you know, like, the, the the times when there were lots of dragons interacting, like like this time period in Hot D, um, is only described by the maesters in the history books and you know we don't get detail like fire and blood is not like a detailed novel it's only a brief plot summary written by the maesters so and the maesters generally don't like dragons and don't like describing dragons and don't know much about dragons so the the whole sort of dragon lore thing in the books is still quite mysterious like how dragons work is quite mysterious um and yeah it was vermithor that we saw in um in Daemon's scene. And I like how Daemon was, like, singing, like, a Valyrian lullaby to the dragon to keep Vermithor chill. Uh, I wonder what the words of the lullaby were. The, uh, what's his name? David Peter Peterson is the linguist who created the Valyrian language for Game of Thrones. Um, he can probably offer a translation of what Daemon was saying in the lullaby. That would be cool. Um... El Capitan asks if this dragon is a match for Vagar. There is nothing in this world as powerful as Vagar. There is, I mean, maybe if a bunch of other dragons ganged up on Vagar, then then maybe. But but there is no one dragon that could likely. I mean, I mean, maybe if if it's lucky. But Vagar outclasses every other dragon. Adam says, "Where did Harold Westerling go after walking out of the council meeting?" Yeah. So Eric left the Greens and came and joined Rhaenyra, but Harold Westerling left the Greens and has not shown up. Um, and I suppose this this is like a super mild spoiler. Ah, I don't think it's a spoiler. Um, in the books, Harold Westerling is literally only mentioned one time ever in, in the entire series. Um, and it says that Harold Westerling uh, exists um, and, and then doesn't. That's the entirety of the mention of Harold Westerling in the books. Um, so basically everything that Harold does is, it, everything that Harold does is made up for the show. So, uh, book readers, we, we, we don't know what, what happens with Harold. So it is really interesting that he has this, you know, 
moment of leaving the council and, and we don't know where he is or what he does. I, I, I get a lot of Barristan vibes with Harold. I think it's quite possible that he'll like turn up later. And there are a few ways that he could, there are a few things that could happen with him. Uh, but yeah, it's not in the books, so we don't know for sure. Uh, Desorn says, why is Cyrax the same size now as 20 years ago? Uh, Cyrax should be bigger. Cyrax should be bigger. Do you think it's the same? Here's Cyrax now. Looking pretty big. And let's have a look at Cyrax previously. This is how Cyrax looked before. I think Cyrax has gotten a little bit bigger. I don't think Cyrax has gotten like massively bigger, but I think Cyrax is bigger. Yeah, it's not it's not a huge change. Cyrax certainly should be bigger at this point. Jenks says Rhaenyra just finished saying how Boros is arrogant, and then she sends Luke to him with nothing but a reminder of his allegiance. Makes zero sense. Yeah, I think Rhaenyra probably should have like thought a bit more about how to win over these lords. I mean, I think she was she was stuck in that mindset of like, oh, like, you know, Lord Boromond was always supportive of, of us, so Boros will be supportive as well. And, you know, Rhaenyra had a lot of other things on her mind, like the death of her father to think about, and the stillborn baby that just died. Like, you know, Rhaenyra might not have been thinking as much as she should have, I guess. Um, but yeah, I mean, I mean, usually that's enough. Like, like usually sending a Targaryen on a dragon or a Valarion on a dragon is enough to remind people. And I'm, and, and remember, like these lords, or at least the fathers of these lords, swore oaths to support Rhaenyra in front of everyone. The king said that Rhaenyra is my heir, so it's like Rhaenyra shouldn't have to go out of her way to convince these people who already should support her. But, but, but yeah, like it would have been smarter to think. A bit more about it and you can question whether it was a good idea to send jace and luke at all like jace and luke are so young that like they are not politicians really they're not diplomats they're not they're, uh, it, it was a risk to send them I, I think that they're sort of relying on the shock and awe of the dragons um because dragons can be very persuasive um, but, you know, I mean, the Greens have dragons as well, so they probably should have anticipated that the Greens might have the same idea and send their own dragons. So, yeah, I, I think it may have been a mistake to send Jason Luke like that. Soda says, now that the season is finished, can you review Internet Historians redoing the Game of Thrones finale? Since you're the same person. <laughs> um, I haven't seen that video. I, I mean, uh, yeah, I haven't seen that video. Uh, it might be fun to like react to other videos, I guess. I don't know. I don't know what that video is about. Uh, Ahmed says, speaking of the prophecy, this is a wild guess. The sword ice was melted down by fire to bring Oathkeeper, which handle has the shape of a lion head. Uh, yeah, so you're talking about like the sword ice, um, which was melted down uh, into Widow's Whale and Oathkeeper in season four, episode one. Uh, so you're saying that sword is the is the song of ice and fire? Is that what you're saying, Ahmed? I guess. Um, but I think the cat's paw blade is the one that, you know, that's what's used to kill the White Walkers in the show. Thank you, Jesse. And thank you, Cole, who says, Is it me or is Kristen Cole supposed to be the reverse Jamie? A man with honor losing it, as opposed to a man without honor gaining it. Yeah, th I mean, there are similarities between Kristen and Jamie. I mean, they, they both sort of grapple with their oaths. And while Jamie, uh, in the books, starts to try to be less shit, Kristen really seems to be on a downward trajectory. Um, he, he takes his dishonor badly and just dishonors himself more. I, I, you know, I think that, like, Kristen thinks that he was dishonored by having sex with Rhaenyra, but I think what really has dishonored Kristen is all of his murders, killing Joffrey Lonmouth, killing Lyman Beesbury, just generally being a, a hateful shit stirrer. Um, I think like w one of the interesting things compar comparing the show and the books is that in the books, Kristen seems to have a much bigger role. I mean, especially in like the earlier books, I, I think that George kind of retconned the this part of the history books a little bit. Because in, like, the earliest mentions, it they really pin the whole war on Kristen. Like, the, the early books make it sound like Kristen caused this conflict. They call Kristen the Kingmaker. 
Um, and in the books, it was Kristen who convinced Aegon, hey, y- you should you should agree to be king in the books. Um, in the books, it was Kristen who found Aegon at the child fighting pit and said, hey, Aegon, you've got to become king or else Rhaenyra is going to kill you and that's why you should be king. Um, and so some characters say that Kristen is the reason why this conflict happens and Kristen is the reason why Aegon becomes king. It's like a whole thing. Uh, whereas they sort of removed Kristen's influence at that part of the story in Hot D, which is interesting. Um, and yeah, like in the show, Kristen, it looks like it might have been an accident when Kristen killed Lyman. Like, I don't think Kristen deliberately killed Lyman. It just sort of happened. Um, whereas in the books, it, it it was a deliberate murder by Kristen. And, and in the books, it, it, it seems like Kristen killing Lyman was, like, a really conclusive moment of, like, okay, like, we're doing it. Like, Kristen killing Lyman was, like, the, the point of no return, where the Greens were, like, okay, we're doing it. Um, and Kristen, you know, had more of a voice at the Green Council in the books. Like, he was arguing, like, hey, we, we, we need a crown Aegon, not support Rhaenyra, because Rhaenyra is such a big slutty slut who's going to turn the Red Keep into a brothel, he says in the books. Um, so Kristen has a bigger role in starting the war in the books. Thanks for the super chat from Jess, who says, the response from the mother of Lord Tyrell is very funny in the books, if I remember correctly. Well, we'll we'll, we'll get to that. Lotana says, this is all Otto's fault. Yeah, I mean, one of the sort of tragic ironies of this whole situation is that Otto is saying, we've got to kill Rhaenyra because otherwise Rhaenyra will kill us. And, and Daemon is saying we've got to kill the Greens or else the Greens are going to kill us. But neither Rhaenyra or Alicent want to kill anyone. <laughs> um, and neither does Aegon, particularly. Like, like, like the actual people at the center of this conflict don't want peace. Uh, do want peace. They don't want war. And I think that Otto and, you know, to some extent Daemon, like their eagerness... Um, it's like a game theory thing. Like, if both sides just agreed to be peaceful, then there'd be no cost. But since both sides assume that the other side will attack, then it becomes in your interests to attack, you know? Um, so, yeah, it's tragic. And and the actors and interviews and stuff have said that, you know, if Rhaenyra and Alicent could just sit down in a room without all of these bloody lords around, then they probably could sort this out between themselves, you know? And that's why I think it's so unfortunate that it was Otto who came to deliver the terms. Otto is the last person who either who either Rhaenyra or Daemon are going to submit to or agree to, you know? Uh, I thought it was interesting that after Otto presented the terms, Rhaenyra said, you know, I will, I will let you know my answer in a few days. King's, a- King's Landing will have my answer on the morrow. So it sounds like Rhaenyra like, might actually be considering like agreeing to Otto's terms and making peace. But now that Luke is dead, there's kind of no going back from that. Thanks for the super chat from Alex and from Shadow, who says, Do you think that the seasons going forward will be constructed like season one, with five episodes for the younger versions and then five episodes for the adult versions? Uh, I don't want to spoil anything, but like... There's not going to be big time skips so much. Sunkist says the idea we control the dragons is an illusion. Uh, Amish says, what's up with Boros Baratheon being illiterate? Yeah, so Boros got the letter from Rhaenyra and he said, oh, where's the bloody maester? Come and get the maester to read this for me. Um, Because, yeah, Boros can't read. And that's actually very common. Like, a lot of lords don't read. Uh, it sort of depends where you are and which which culture you're in in Westeros, um, but yeah, many many lords don't read and they rely on the maces to do it for them, and that's part of why some characters are like, hey, maybe we shouldn't trust the maces because like who knows if they're really um, telling the truth about what's in these letters? Maybe they want to manipulate things, and there is a whole theory that the maces might have manipulated the Greens and the Blacks into into attacking each other. Because the maesters don't like the Targaryens, and they don't like the dragons, and they don't like the magic, and they want a more stable, peaceful, secular world without magic and bl- blood and fire. So, so yeah, that that's a thing. Uh, thanks, Joshua. Thanks, Jack, who says, Corlys seemed to be pretty cool with the Vaymond murder when he found out about it. Yeah, I, I agree. I agree, Jack. Um, like, Corlys wakes up from this fever... 
And then Rhaenyra says that, uh, you know, hey, by the way, um, your friend Daemon killed your brother Vaemond. And Corlys' reaction is like, oh, yeah, that's that, that sounds right. He, he sort of rolls his eyes and then he says, oh, well, you know, Vaemond was too ambitious. Which is, it's a pretty sanguine reaction to the to the murder of his brother. Because it kind of was murder. Like, da- Daemon did not have, like, a legal right to kill Vaemond, really. Like, it's not like the king had ordered Vaemond's execution. When Vaemond died, Viserys just said, like, I will have your tongue for that. And then Daemon cut off his head and said he can keep his tongue. So, like, it, it is messed up that Daemon killed Vaemond like that. And Corlys is like, oh, yeah, that's cool. My friend killed my brother, whatever. Like, really? And then, like, Corlys mentioned that he believes that Rhaenyra killed their son, Laenor. And I thought it was weird that Rhaenys did not correct Corlys. Because, like, Rhaenyra told Rhaenys previously that Rhaenyra did not kill Laenor. But Rhaenys does not tell Corlys that. Like, I, I feel like I feel like it should be a bigger deal that Rhaenyra supposedly killed Laenor, you know? Which, incidentally, is, is also not in the books. Like, in the books, it seems as though Daemon may have killed Laenor. Um, but the whole thing about Laenor getting away free is, is not even a thing in the books. Uh, another thing that I, I liked was that we got to meet uh, Bartimus Keltegar. Uh, who is who is the leader of one of the only surviving Valyrian houses. Um, like, you know, in all of those scenes when, like, Corlys and Viserys were saying, ah, the Targaryens and the Valerians are the, the last of the Valyrian houses. There are no other Valyrian houses, only the Targaryens and the Valerians. Uh, that's Keltegar Erasure, because the Keltegars are also a Valyrian house. They are not as powerful as the Targaryens and the Valerians. They don't have a great fleet of ships and they don't have dragons, but the Keltigars are Valyrian. So it's nice to see the Keltigars actually turn up for once because they are one of they are one of the, you know, loyal, long-standing allies of the Targaryens. Yeah, crabs in the chat, folks. Crabs in the chat for House Keltigar because their sigil is the crab. Uh, the Keltigars have a Valyrian steel axe in the books, which is super cool. So, yeah, it's nice to see the Keltigars turn up. And they mentioned some of the other, like, allies um, of the, like, the houses in the Crownlands who support the Targaryens and the Valerians. There's, like, the Baremons and the Masseys um, and some of those folks who live in the area around King's Landing. And they are, like, directly sworn to the Iron Throne. Uh, but in this case, they're, they're swearing to Rhaenyra and, and the Valerians because they have, like, close alliances with Dragonstone and Driftmark. But yeah, they, they are very minor houses, so so the Blacks really don't have much of an army to go up against the Greens with. Colleen says, Did you see Daemon's neck? His right, under his ear, looks like the show is giving him grayscale. I don't think that Daemon has grayscale. That would be a weird thing to add. I guess it's possible. Are, are you saying his neck here? We have seen in the past that Daemon appears to have, like, burns on his body, which I think probably comes from the moment when we saw Daemon get hit by a flaming arrow on the Stepstones previously. So I I think that that flaming arrow burned him, and that's why he has burned skin. I don't think it's grayscale, but hey, if they wanted to do something wild, they could. I mean, you know, grayscale makes people go mad and turn into stone men zombies eventually. Um, So I guess if they wanted to, like, add a plot point about, like, oh no, Daemon's going crazy because he's got magic leprosy, watch out. Like, I guess they could do that, but, like, I I think Daemon is interesting because the reason why he is a violent arsehole is emotional and understandable, so I, I I don't think they're going to give him grayscale. I, I really think that Kragos Crabfeeder having grayscale, it, it was just a cosmetic decision to make him look spooky, and I think that it, it worked. Thanks for the super chat from Jinx, who says, Are we to assume that Amond knew that Arax was acting out against Luke's wishes? Did he hear Luke berating Arax? That context is important. Okay, let, I mean, let's, yeah, let's think about that. So what, what happened was that Amond 
got on Vega and flew after Luke, who was flying on his dragon Arax. And, and I mean, right right away, my question is like, Amond, what is your plan? Like, what is Amond's plan here? What does he want to happen? Like, it's pretty clear that Amond did not want to kill Luke, because that is like a big escalation. Um, and his, you know, Alicent and Otto were going to be pissed. It could start a war. Like, he killed a prince. That's a big deal. So Aemon did not want to kill Luke. He just wanted to, like, scare Luke. He just wanted to bully him. I mean, we saw Aemon, like, laughing maniacally, um, which I thought was fun. Like, he was, he was like the bad guy in a movie. Like, the, he was like the jock who, like, bullies the, you know, like, he's the, he's the big bad guy, big tough guy bullying the small kid. Um, and, you know, I think that's consistent with, like, Amon's character, because, you know, Amon himself used to be the, the smaller, bullied kid, and we saw him, you know, have that power rush, um, in episode 7, when, when he was all of a sudden, like, he had all this power, and he was, um, just full of, like, ego, um, and that gave him this sort of violent confidence, and this sort of, like, wanting to get revenge on people, like, you know, Luke had bullied him, with that, you know, pink dread when he was a kid. And I think that, you know, having Vega has really changed who Amond is. Like, he, he's suddenly powerful and he's suddenly confident, but he also feels wronged and he also feels bitter still, which is a dangerous combination, right? Because Amond is powerful, but still feels like he's not respected enough. And, it, like, Amond feels like he has the right to hurt people because of how he was hurt, even though he is no longer the underdog. Like, he is no longer the underdog, but he still feels like an underdog. And so he feels like he's justified in, like, bullying and attacking people, even though he's no longer the underdog, you know? Um, anyway, but, but yeah, like, it's obviously wildly irresponsible to be chasing a prince through a storm on Vega. Like, Vega is the biggest nuclear arsenal in the world. Like, you don't fire nukes at someone as a prank, even if the nukes are diffused, you know? Even if you don't plan to blow up the nukes, like, you, you should not fire missiles at people. You should not get your, like, nuclear submarine and, and use it to buzz your friends in their rowboat. Like, that's what's happening right now. Um, and I guess Amon just wanted to scare Luke and then fly away. But, you know, Luke was terrified, Arax was terrified, and Arax's reaction, eventually, uh, was to burn Vega. Like, Arax swoops up and, and shoots a, a gout of flame at Vega, which I guess is a way of saying, like, fuck off, leave me alone. Which, you know, terrible idea. <laughs> terrible idea to attack Vega, because that's only going to piss Vega off. But that was, you know, in Arax's fear and desperation, that's what Arax did, and Luke did not order that, because we hear Luke saying, um, no, like, don't do that. No, Arax, serve me, but then Arax burned Vega. So, neither Luke nor Amond wanted to escalate this into violence. And then Vega gets pissed off, um, and ignores Amond's orders, and then kills Arax and Luke. So, it, this was very much like the dragon's doing the violence. But, I mean, the the kids, like, Amond and Luke really led the dragons there through this whole chase sequence. Like, they were so dumb to do this chase in the first place. Um, but, yeah, like, you know, when you give a kid a giant massive weapon, um, you know, I mean, they say don't play with fire. This is what happens when you play with fire. But, yeah, again, it is very different to the books, because in the books it seems like it, it was deliberate. Anyway, thanks for the super chat, who says, Vega is a level 100 Pokemon. Amond doesn't have enough gym badges. Luinator says, do you think there are some hardcore conservative viewers that support Aegon even though he is horrible and don't want Rhaenyra to be ruler just because she is a woman? Um, I don't know. I th <laughs> there's, there's a lot of people who think a lot of different things, Luinator. Um, I mean, certainly one of the themes of the story in the books and the show is that a lot of people don't want Rhaenyra to be queen because she's female and, like, the, this whole monarchical system is based around um, male inheritance. Um, so, yeah, that is a political angle. Thanks for the super chat from Biotic, who says, 
sneaking up on the characters? How did giant granny Vega sneak up on Luke? I, I really like the way that they shot that. Like, Luke was, like, scared that Vega might be chasing him. And he's, like, looking behind his shoulder. And he's like, ooh, is Vega behind me? And it's like, oh, no, Vega is above me. And Vega, like, swoops over from above. And we see, like, the thunder lighting up the sky. And we see Vega. It's like the opening shot of Star Wars and New Hope, in it? Um like the big swooping spaceship the great power over the smaller underdog I, I really like that shot jess says so sad that luke didn't even want driftmark anymore because it would mean everyone else would have to die now he's the first casualty yeah that's a good point that's a good irony that like earlier on luke was saying um i don't want to be the heir because you know i'll only take driftmark when everyone else is dead but nope it was luke who died before anyone else and i really liked you know the opening shot of this episode was luke on the painted table um touching the driftmark symbol on the painted table and saying that i should not be the lord of driftmark and so again i think that reminds us that you know it is the parents fault for putting their kids in this political situation that they are just not prepared for and don't want i mean it parallels aegon like aegon did aegon says a similar thing in the previous episode where aegon was saying i don't want to be king i am not suited to be king and luke here is saying the same thing he says i should not be the lord of driftmark because i get seasick like and the lord of driftmark is in charge of the biggest navy in the world like it makes no sense and also there's the fact that luke is not really Lenor valarion's son so like it's such a shitty situation to be in and the death of Luke also raises political questions about Driftmark because, you know, Luke was going to marry uh, Rainer Targaryen. And so Luke and Rainer were going to be the rulers of Driftmark. Or, you know, Luke was the ruler and uh, Rainer would be his lady. But now, you know, that marriage is dissolved. So, like, who's going to get Driftmark now? Like, I suppose that Driftmark will now go to um, Luke's younger son, Joffrey Valerion. Jo Joffrey has a role in uh, the books, like when uh, they send Luke and uh, Jason Luke off to fly to their allies. Um, in the books, Joffrey, little, little Joffrey, the youngest kid, is like, I want to go too, because Joffrey also has a dragon. And so Joffrey's like, I'm, I want to go and fly and, and help as well. And Rainier is like, no, nah, no, nah, you're too young. Like, Jason Luke can go, but Joffrey is staying at home. Um, but, you know, Joffrey was really eager to participate as well. I hope we get to see more of Joffrey. Good kid. Thanks for the super chat from Kyle, who says, What differences are there between show Amond and book Amond up until this point? Um, well, we talked about some of the differences. Um, I, I think mostly they're pretty faithful. Like, again, like the, the show mostly, like, fleshes out the details but it mostly stays faithful to like the overall structure like the basic summary that's in the books i mean it is a big change that in the books it seems that amon deliberately killed luke um whereas in the show it seems to have been vega amon wasn't in control um but otherwise i think they're pretty similar i mean i mean one i mean one difference is that like you know for the previous episode uh they mentioned that when they find amon and, and when they tell Amond that, like, hey, um, King Viserys is dead, um, Amond's reply is, um, let, let, let me get a quote for you, you'll enjoy this. Um, Amond's reply is, is Aegon king, or must we kneel and kiss the old whore's cunny? Yeah, that is the regrettable words of Aemon Targaryen when he's saying are we gonna make my brother Aegon king or are we gonna have to submit to Rhaenyra that's what he calls Rhaenyra it, they they call Rhaenyra a whore a lot uh in the books um uh, part of like you know people use Rhaenyra's sexuality to disparage her like that you know since a lot of people know um that Rhaenyra's children are the bastards of Harwin Strong and you know now she's hooked up with Daemon and had another couple of kids and you know she was married to Laenor who a lot of people knew was gay um and people are prejudiced against that and you know call Rhaenyra a big old slut and says that she shouldn't be in charge because of that which is ironic because Aegon has lots of bastards and Aegon rapes people and yet not many people disparage him for his sexuality um so you know that's part of the theme is like the misogyny of that um being used against Rhaenyra 
Thanks for the super chat from Blackfire, who says, Rhaenyra preferred to refuse help and birth a scaly corpse than be yet another victim of the crown of knives, which took her mother and sister-in-law. Yeah, that that's a great point, Blackfire. Like, while Rhaenyra is in labor, um, and, she, and she's angry and, and horrified giving birth, like, no doubt what is going through her mind is the memory of her mother, Emma, who, who died um, in the childbed, had her baby cut out of her body in that horrific C-section that killed her, um, and in the books, um, her grandmother, Daella Targaryen, died in childbirth, um, and yeah, Lena died in childbirth. So yeah, no doubt that is what Rainier is thinking about when she's like, I don't want this to be happening. This should not be happening. And you know, the knowledge that it's premature and the knowledge that the baby might not survive. Really horrific stuff. Thanks for the super chat from Mr. Itani Muli, who says, Granny Vega thought she was back in dawn. Yeah, that's one of the memes that I really enjoy. <laughs> is, you know, a lot of people are making memes about how Vega is is basically just like a, a doddery old woman who who is sort of losing her marbles and she thinks that, you know, she, her, she just keeps thinking about her her old writer Visenya and the wars in Dawn and she's just like, oh, are we are we going to Sunspear to barbecue some more Dornishmen, Visenya? And Amon's like, no, no, we're, we're, it's, it, it's the greens and the blacks. Vega, it's a different thing now, and she's like, eh, okay, uh, I enjoy that meme, um, and you know, it also bears remembering that Vega is, um, Vega has caused so much destruction, <laughs> like Vega, uh, as much, I mean, Vega, you know, it's not really Vega's choice how she is used, sometimes, I guess it is her choice in this case, but like, you know, Vega participated in the Wars of Conquest, um, and after the Wars of Conquest, there was this period called the Dragon's Wrath, where Aegon's uh, sister wife, Rhaenys, was killed in Dawn. And so Aegon and Visenya went and just burned the crap out of Dawn repeatedly. Like, there's a line about, like, every castle in Dawn was, was raised to a scorched desolation three times over, and, like, thousands of people were killed by Vega and Beleriand in Dawn. Um... And it's like, after Vega has been used for such destruction so many times, it's like, well, it's not surprising that, that Vega's first instinct is violence, you know? Like, Vega is too old to, to put up with this shit. <laughs> like, Vega is too old to be dealing with, with this rivalry between these teenagers. So you better believe if some whippersnapper dragon you know, bursts some flame in her face, she's gonna chomp the motherfucker. Like, that's what Vega does, you know? So it it kind of makes perfect sense. Thanks for the super chat from Elm, who says, do you foresee a glimpse of the world beyond the wall in future seasons? I, I mean, they have... Like, one of the bigger changes in the show is that they talked about this prophecy about the Targaryens needing to unite against the White Walkers, and that is not something that is mentioned in in this part of the books. So it would not be crazy for them to explore that a little bit. Like, I would be shocked if we, you know, saw any White Walkers in this show. I, I That would surprise me, but I, I don't suppose it's impossible, because, I mean, you know, like, the White Walkers are, you know, they do exist at this point in the story. The White Walkers are, like, dormant at this point in the story, it seems. Which might be because of all the dragons in the world. It's all very mysterious, like, when the White Walkers are around and when the dragons are around. It is possible that, like, the, dra the, the White Walkers are dormant because there's lots of dragons around at the moment. Like, you know, this is the time of fire. But then after the dragons die out, it becomes, like, a time of ice. And there's sort of, like, meta-magic seasonal cycles of ice and fire. I mean, that is pure speculation, but that is, that might be something like what's going on. Um, and, you know, Jace has been told to fly to Winterfell and to talk to Cregan Stark. And so, you know, that would be an opportunity to talk about some White Walkery stuff. Um, so, you know, anything's possible. Um, if you're interested in some of the, you know, White Walkery secrets of the North and the Starks, you might not. You might like to watch the Alt Shift X video called "Ancient Stark Secrets," 
That's a fun video, and that goes into ideas about how the Starks might have intermarried with the White Walkers, the Starks might have White Walker blood, you know, the wall might have been built to facilitate child sacrifice to the White Walkers, ancient agreements, ancient pacts. If you're interested in any of those old uh, Stark White Walker mysteries, you might like to watch that that video, Ancient Stark Secrets. Um, thanks for the super chat from Heather, who says the more Rainies's reveal, the more Rainies reveals herself. I agree with Alicent that she would have been an amazing queen. She's wise with a perfect temperament. Thank you for the live chats. Thank you, Heather. Um, yeah, I mean, Rainies thought carefully about her decisions in this episode. Like Rainies at first seemed as though she would not commit to Rhaenyra or would not commit to Alicent. Like, I think it is wise for her to not want to get involved in this conflict because she doesn't want more of her family to die. Um, I don't know if Rhaenys' decision-making was great in the previous episode when Rhaenys, like, killed a whole bunch of innocent common people. Like, I, I still feel weird about that uh, in the previous episode. When, when Rhaenys and Melis, like, burst up through the floor and a, and a bunch of common people got squashed. It's really hard to see, like, how many common people squashed. How many common people died. I, I mean, it looks like a lot. <laughs> like, it looks like it must be hundreds who died. But, like, the way that it was shot did not focus on the common people. So, it, you know. And then in the inside the episode, they were all saying, wow, what a great heroic moment for Rainies. And there was, like, no acknowledgement of the people that she killed. Um, which is weird, because it clashes with her, like mercy to the greens you know and i'm not sure how much that is deliberate on the part of the showrunners like do the showrunners want us to think wow rainies is so cool and so peaceful she was merciful or do the showrunners want us to think wow kind of messed up that she killed all those common people but nice that she saved the greens i guess i i'm, I'm holding out hope that it will make sense in the long run like i'm not going to spoil anything but you know mazaria warned us the only power is what the people let you have, you know. So we are we are being told that the people matter. Um, but yeah, look, I, I think that Rainies has shown some wisdom. Like apart from the murdering the common people, I think that Rainies does show some wisdom um, throughout the season. Like she's she she thinks before she acts, and I think that she has been burned before. You know, like she's an older person. She's seen some shit. She's seen people make mistakes. She has suffered loss, and so she doesn't want to leap into anything without um, considering it first. Um, and I, I, I do like Rainies's point here. Um, when Rainies says, like, like Caller says, "Hey, like, let's not participate in the war," but then Rainies says, "No, we have to participate in the war because at this point it's too late." Like maybe. If we made better decisions earlier, we could have avoided this war. But at this point, like, we are involved in this war. Um, there's no escaping it. Like, that's my interpretation of what Rainey says. Um, so, you know, I think that makes sense. Um, and, and I like the role that Rainey's plays this episode in convincing Corliss, like, we've got to participate here. And that obviously is a huge deal, because the Valarions are so powerful. Um, and the Blacks really need them in order to survive. Johnny in the live chat says, Rainies doesn't give a duck. Power is power. Team diggers. Too much pride. Yeah. Thanks for the donation from Schmuckayla, who says, What are your feelings on the maybe new upcoming Jon Snow show? Uh, yeah. Um, yeah. Does Game of Thrones Season 8 need a sequel? <laughs> I don't know. I don't know. Ge Georgia R. Martin, the author has said that he's excited about the Jon Snow show. If George thinks it's a good idea, then maybe it is a good idea. I mean, I thought that this House of the Dragon show might be a bad idea, but it turned out to be good. So maybe the Jon Snow show would be good. My question is, like, what is the Jon Snow show about? Like, we saw Jon Snow go beyond the wall, hanging out with some wildlings. Like, what's he gonna do? Like, is he gonna get involved in wildling politics? Is he gonna fight some thins? Is he going to be a diplomat with the Scargosi? Like, the stakes have gone down. Like, presumably John won't be involved in southern politics, because they're not going to bring back all the actors, like Sansa and Bran, are they? Um, I don't know what the Jon Snow show would be about. I would like it if it was just, like, a really, like, low-key 
drama with like just John in like a love triangle with a couple of wildlings, you know, just going hunting for food and making snow castles like that. You could do some fun things like some chill things, low key drama things but like it's game of thrones they want bombast they want sword fights and dragons so are they going to bring back the white walkers Ooh, it what, what what's that star wars rise of skywalker quote somehow the night king returned is that what they're gonna do in the Jon snow show i i it doesn't seem like a great idea to me but i hope i will be proven wrong and i mean keep in mind that like there's it's not like like it's just in development. Most shows in development don't get made into actual shows. It's unlikely that all of these shows are going to be made, uh, that are actually going to make it to air. So we'll see what happens. Thanks for the super chat from Caesar, who says, what do you think about how they changed Luke's death? I think we've already talked about it. I, I, it is a bold change to make it seem like an accident. Um... It raises questions about Amon's character. I think it fits with the theme of, like, historical inaccuracy. Like, the the book Fire and Blood is all about how things are always more complicated than the history books say. And sometimes rumor and bias gets in the way. And I do like the idea of Amon being like, oh, fuck. Like, I, I, I'm a kinslayer by accident, so I better pretend I killed Luke on purpose, and I've just got to embrace the role of the villainous kinslayer. Like, I think that's kind of a fun idea for Amond. And, you know, it's sort of similar, even like Daemon, you know, plays with the idea of his depraved reputation, and like, the, all the questions about your rep- your reputation versus the reality are all interesting questions. It's, you know, I, I think it's cool. And also, like, it does sort of make perfect sense in terms of, like, the dragon lore, like, Daenerys has a lot of trouble controlling her dragons, and, you know, th- th- these are children trying to wield weapons of war, and it's like, well, of course, of course there'd be accidents. I mean, accidents happen in real wars. I mean, like, nuclear Armageddon almost happened a couple of times during the Cold War, because, like, someone, 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 you know, some wires got crossed, and there was some confusion about orders, and, like, you know, wasn't there one time some, like, you know, Soviet nuclear submarine almost launched the nukes, but then they were like, Oop, whoops, countermand that... We spilled coffee on the console. It, it, we, we didn't actually mean to send those orders or whatever. You know, accidents happen in wars. But I, I think that you could say that the, the, this show House of the Dragon has maybe... It, it, it has maybe done too much... It has maybe made this conflict too much of an accident, too much of a whoopsie. Like, there's a lot of weird, like, accidents in the season. Like, for example... Alicent misunderstands Viserys's words. Alicent, in the show, believes that Viserys wants Aegon to be king. But he, but she's wrong. Viserys was actually talking about Aegon's prophecy, and Viserys actually wanted Rhaenyra to be king. That That's a big change from the books. In the books, there's no mention of that. In the books, Alicent just wants her son Aegon to be king. Um, and making it, like, a tragic misunderstanding leading to conflict, you know, I... I, I I think that takes away the power of the character-driven decisions. Like, I I think the story is more powerful when characters make choices as opposed to characters make accidental mistakes and misunderstandings. Like, you don't want the story to all just be a series of random occurrences. You want the story to be driven by character decisions. So I I think that you could argue that House of the Dragon has, has added too many accidents into the story but you know uh your take may vary thanks for the super chat from jess who says amond being an accidental kinslayer reminds me of micah and baylor yeah that's a good comparison um in the hedge knight which is one of the game of thrones uh prequel stories there's an incident where uh there's a trial by combat where a bunch of, of knights and a couple of princes participate in this big uh, battle for the life of Duncan the Tall, and it's a, a fun little dramatic fight that happens where Micah accidentally kills um, this other prince, uh, Baylor Breakspear, and and it's really sad and tragic because Baylor was the heir to the throne, and everyone loved Baylor, and Baylor was like a great guy. So like Micah has to live for the rest of his life, going like, oh fuck, like I accidentally killed my family. This is fucked up. Um, and it's really sad and tragic. And um, yeah, Amon dissimilar. 
Uh, Sean asks about a Alt Shift X Dune live stream that may happen. Best Dad says, "Will we see other Valyrian swords in future seasons?" Uh, yes, there will be other Valyrian swords. I mean, we've got like Blackfire, the ancestral sword of the Conqueror. We've got Dark Sister, the sword of Visenya, now carried by Daemon. Um, and yeah, there are other swords around. There is a Hightower sword, if I remember rightly. And Kel- I-, I hope that Keltigar's Valyrian axe turns up. That would be cool as well. Uh, but yeah, good good idea to keep an eye on the Valyrian swords. And I like how they emphasize like the political, symbolic significance of these swords. Um, thanks for the super chat from Case, who says, What is the status of Driftmark by the time Game of Thrones happens? I feel like it's never mentioned. Yeah, it's really interesting that, that the Valerions are just kind of irrelevant by the time of the main series. Like, right now, the Valerions are, like, probably the second most powerful house in the realm. Uh, but in the main Game of Thrones storyline, the Valerions swear to support uh, Stannis because, you know, Stannis is on Dragonstone and the Valerions traditionally support Dragonstone and, and the Crown Lands and whatnot. Um, but yeah, the Valerions are just not very important. I think one of them dies. Um, it, it mentions that they're blonde, like, so they have that, like, Valyrian blonde hair in the books. But yeah, they're, they're just not very important anymore, which which is a little bit like, you know, like with Hot D, it's like, oh, there's all these dragons around. And then you watch later on the Game of Thrones show, there's no dragons. And you're like, huh, something happened to all the dragons. And we think the same thing about uh, House Valerion. House Valerion's really powerful in House of the Dragon, but in Game of Thrones, they're irrelevant. So it's like, huh, what happened to the Valerions? That's something that we're going to find out about. What causes the downfall of the Valerions? And, and you know, also, like, the, the power of House Valerion is a recent development. Like, keep in mind that it, it was specifically Corliss's voyages that made House Valerion super powerful in recent times. he It was him who made the Valerions super rich and built their new castle. Um, so, you know, it's it's not like the Valerions have always been this powerful. I, I can pull up some more Valerion information if we're interested. Um, yeah, so it's Lord Monford Valerion who supports Stannis on Dragonstone in Book 2. Um, and they talk about Monford's arrogance having the blood of Valyria, and his house had provided brides for Targaryen princes, including, you know, a reference to Lena there in Book 2 of Game of Thrones. Um, and some of the Valerion ships burn at the Battle of the Blackwater. Remember, like, when Tyrion blew up the bay with the wildfire? There were some Valerion- Valerions burning in there. Um, uh, Lord Monford died in the Battle of the Blackwater, and the new Lord Valarion was Lord Monteris Valarion uh, in Book 3. A six-year-old becomes the new leader of House Valarion, so that's probably another reason why they're not very significant in the main series. And Oh, and yeah, we do have Orain Waters, who is a Valarion bastard who is um, gets invited to Cersei's small council. Cersei makes Orain her admiral, and Cersei builds Orain a bunch of very expensive ships, and then Orain leaves and takes the ships. Orain Waters steals the very expensive royal fleet and, and becomes a pirate king. Um, so not a great decision by Cersei there. Uh, so yeah, there's, there's several reasons why the Valerians are less powerful. Thanks for the super chat from Factory, who says, Nick, Covey, and Michelle's watch party. Appreciate your content. Thanks for your expertise. Thank you, Factory. Glad you're enjoying. The Gaia says, How did Daemon know about Luke's fate? Wouldn't he and Arax's bodies just be lost in the Narrow Sea? Yeah, that's a good question. I mean, I think that the people of Storm's End would have seen that there was a fight, there was fire in the sky. Um... But, yeah, I mean, I guess, yeah, they wouldn't have known for sure until, like, I guess maybe at this point Amont has already returned to King's Landing and already told the Greens that Luke is dead. But, like, yeah, I mean, maybe maybe the Greens would want to keep it quiet that Luke died for as long as possible to try and do some damage control. Like, just like the Greens tried to keep it quiet that King Viserys was dead last episode, maybe they also would try to not spread it around that Prince Luke was murdered by Prince Amont. Um, so yeah, that, that's a reasonable question. Like, like maybe it shouldn't, you know, but, but I mean, we also don't know how much time has passed 
until that final scene with Rhaenyra. Like, maybe may, for all we know, it could be days or weeks since since the death until Rhaenyra finds out. So you know, she found out somehow. Thank you, Alchemist. Thank you, Joshua. Mixed opinions about the Jon Snow show. Uh, no spoilers, Platypus. Thank you for the super chat from Smith, who says, As a new father, that birth was hard to watch. Took me back to the fear and anxiety I had before the birth. Yeah, I, I thought it was well done. Double Duck says, Why do the dragons kill other dragons so easily without thought? Do they share the same feelings and intentions as their rider? Yeah, well, I mean, Vagar's old. She, she's had enough of everybody's shit. Um, she's grumpy. Like, the books say that Vagar is, is sleepy and, and grumpy and is just a crotchety old grandma. A crotchety old murder grandma. Um, and, you know, dragons are inherently destructive. Like, dragons are fire-made flesh. Dragons don't settle their disputes with, with diplomacy. And, and I suppose they're not particularly sociable creatures, either. Like, it's it says in the books that they tend to make their lairs alone in, in mountains and caves and, and they sort of spend a lot of time just 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 chilling alone in their caves is what it is what it sounds like so you know dragons are destructive angry aggressive creatures i I mean something to keep in mind is that dragons are possibly not natural like it is hinted in the books that dragons were created by ancient valyrian blood magic from wyverns or wyverns like there are these creature creatures called wyverns who come from the jungles of sothorios and they are like dragons, but they don't breathe fire. And it's hinted that the ancient Valyrian blood mages took wyverns and did some kind of dark blood magic uh, to imbue them with the power of fire, and also to like create some kind of hybridization with humans. Um, there's all sorts of um, spooky, horrifying stuff going on with like Valyrian blood magic. Um, and it sounds as though, like, the Targaryens as a people may have been created by blood magic by, like, hybridizing them with dragons. And that is how Targaryens have this, like, magical connection to dragons. This, th- th- these um, images, by the way, were created with um, an AI image generation program. This is Night Cafe um, Stable Diffusion was used to make a bunch of these scary images of Valyrian blood magic, which I think are pretty cool. Anyway, um, yeah, so, like, dragons are, like, they're not, like, natural creatures. They are, like, magic creations. And the the books are always talking about how magic is, like, inherently dangerous and destructive and uncontrollable. So I think it makes perfect sense that dragons are not only destructive of their enemies, dragons are, like, self-destructive. Um, that's what they are. That's what they're for. They are weapons. And just as, you know, the dragons led to the destruction of Valyria, according to Viserys in episode one, it makes sense that they sort of destroy each other and, you know, lead to the downfall of, um, well, we'll see. Thanks for the super chat from Math Debater Club, who says, I think a consistent theme of the show is the disregard of royals towards common folk. Almost every time a moral decision is made, there is literally zero consideration for anyone besides nobles. Yeah, I, I mean, Alicent says several times that she wants to look after the realm. She wants, like, she says repeatedly, like, we need to make peace, we need to do what's best for the realm. And then, you know, she proceeds to crown a monstrous rapist as king, so she's not doing a great job of it. But Alicent at least is paying lip service to the idea of looking after the common people. Um, but yeah, like, like there is not enough consideration of the commons going on here. And that's what Mazaria said last episode. She said, like, we, we got to care about the people. Um, so yeah, that, that is a theme that they are exploring and will continue to explore. And that's very much part of Game of Thrones as well. I mean, especially the books. Um, the Game of Thrones show had less emphasis on the common people and the peasants, But in the books, there is, like, a lot of time, like, you know, Brienne in the Riverlands and Arya in the Riverlands, and, like, there's a huge focus on how much it sucks for everybody who isn't a lord or a lady or a king or a queen because of the decisions of the High Lords. So that that is something that they should explore more as the series goes on. 
Vatio says, I understand the show has communicated to us that Aegon has a messed up moral compass. Is there anything you can say about this and whether there is redemption? Yeah, I, I mean, I, I'm interested, like, in the idea of honor and, and chivalry. Like, I think Kristen Cole especially shows us this idea of, you know, Kristen murders people, but he thinks that's okay because it's honorable and it's chivalrous and he's defending the honor of Alicent and defending himself and you know that th there's like a moral system in place in this world where you know um following certain rules ab around like the hierarchy and around sexuality are considered more important than you know like violence is okay in this system um whereas like having sex with the wrong person is not and so you know george is, is exploring that like particular like medieval value system um, I mean, Aegon, I think, is just a bit of a twat. I mean, Aegon is a terrible person who doesn't care about other people's feelings. And so he, he rapes people and he has children in a... He, he, I mean, he lets his child be a slave in a child fighting pit. Like, I think Aegon's just being... Aeg like, I, I don't think we can say that Aegon is, like, the product of his society. I think Aegon is, is an exceptionally um, unpleasant person. Um, and, you know, like, I, I do think that, I, I do like how they explore Aegon's feelings of rejection from his parents. He feels ignored by Viserys and by Alicent. He feels used by them. Um, and so, it, you know, it makes a kind of sense that Aegon seeks after validation in other places. Um, you know, it doesn't justify his actions, but it makes it more understandable. And, you know, as we've said in videos, that that's very similar to Tyrion. George Martin is always very interested in exploring, like, daddy issues, like a lot of characters in A Song of Ice and Fire feel rejected by their parents, and that drives a lot of their um, negative emotions, so that's a big part of what's going on. And I mean, you know, there's also, like, just the... there's also just seeing how, like, political pressures affect people's decisions. Like, part, I mean, a big part of it is just about how this goddamn monarchy is just such a terrible idea. Like, like, ha like the idea that there is one person who has ultimate power over this entire continent, and the only way to make a change of government is murder and or war, right? Like, there's no democratic option to vote out a king because they're terrible. No, like, you've got to start a war, and a lot of people have got to die. And so, you know, the stakes are so high that um, making these sort of brutal decisions are sometimes necessary. I mean, Otto is a dickhead, but Otto is, is, is right, uh, to some extent, that, like, I mean, you know, Otto's been arguing for a while that the reason why we must wage war against Rhaenyra is that no one will accept Rhaenyra as a ruler, and if Rhaenyra takes the throne, there will be a war. So it's better that we kill Rhaenyra to prevent a larger war that will kill more people. And that is, like, a, you know, that's a really dark argument, but he might be right, you know? Well, I mean, it's like Tywin says, it is better to kill a few people at the Red Wedding than to start a war that will kill thousands more. Um, and, you know, Tywin's a horrible villain, but but there may be some truth in some of the things that he says. I mean, Tywin was wrong in that instance. But, you know, I mean, there's this moment in the books when Davos is talking to Stannis, and Stannis is saying, you know, we should sacrifice one boy we're going to burn Edric Storm so that I can get my crown. Like, it is, it is worth it to sacrifice one child in order to save thousands of lives and prevent a war. As a, you know, it's similar to in the show when Stannis burns Shireen. Like, making the sacrifice of one child to save a kingdom. And there's a line in the books where Stannis says, like, what is the life of one child against a kingdom? And Davos says, everything. Like, yes, like, you can make these Machiavellian decisions about, like, sacrifice for the greater good, but th we lose some of our humanity when we make those choices. Even if they are rational, it is, it is not right and it's not human to let children die, to sacrifice kids. And that's what, you know, Otto wants to do. Otto wants to murder Rhaenyra and Daemon and their children, probably. So... Yeah, there's a lot of there's a lot of complicated moral stuff going on that 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 intersects with the the social and, and cultural realities in Westeros and with the emotional psychological issues of these characters. 
I, I think ultimately it's just a really bad idea to give a person a sword and say your life is more important than others. I mean, it's also just an indictment on the hierarchy in this world, the feudal hierarchy where some people are better than others. And, you know, that's part of why Rhaenys rampages through those common people in the previous episode. Like, Rhaenys thinks really hard about, like, hmm, should I kill Alicent and Aegon? Ooh, you know, they are my family. Maybe I should show them mercy. Meanwhile, her dragon is, like, tail-swiping peasants, just, like, yeeting them into the wall. And it's like, she, she doesn't give them much consideration. And that's because of this, you know, feudal hierarchy. Some people are more important than others. And the books are very focused on exploring how fucked up that is. Thanks. Uh, where's the poll? Yeah, all right. Good Good point. We'll do a poll. All right. Um, there's a poll in the live stream, live chat. Who do you support? Alicent and the Greens or Rhaenyra and the Blacks? Okay. The poll is now live in the live stream. I, f- I feel like I would... Um, I feel like I would, I don't want to bias the poll in any direction, but I feel like, you know, as any pollster will say, the wording of a poll is important. Um, and we could say, do you, do you support Aegon and the Greens? Or we could say, do you support Alicent and the Greens? And I feel like less people are going to vote for Aegon than for Alicent. But Aegon is, is you know, he's the, he's the king, he's the claimant to the throne, so I suppose it should say Aegon, not Alicent. But, um... You know, it's worth remembering who we're fighting for. Uh, so far, uh, the votes are in. We've got 2,000 votes in, and it says 89% of you support Rhaenyra, which is very similar to the previous polls. I don't remember the exact numbers, but I think it was similar, 89%. Um, so overwhelmingly, we support Rhaenyra. And, you know, I, I'm, I'm not surprised, because Rhaenyra is who Viserys wanted to inherit the throne. And Aegon is a pretty horrible person and obviously not suited to be king. Um, you know, Kristen's a dickhead, Otto's a, Otto's a dickhead, Laris is a dickhead, and they're all on the Greens' side. Daemon is also a, a pretty violent, unpleasant person, but he uh, is Doctor Who when he's hot, so I think a lot of people like him anyway. So yeah, overwhelming support for the Blacks. 3,000 votes in and 89% like the Blacks. Thanks for the super chat from Crimson, who says, pretty sure it was just Rhaenys needing to escape. Yeah, so, I mean, there is ambiguity about Rhaenys' escape in the previous episode. Like, you know, maybe bursting up through the floor was the only way that Rhaenys could have possibly escaped, and therefore Rhaenys was justified. Um, I guess you could make that argument. I mean, if you want to, you know, if if we want to think about... I mean, Rhaenys could have just stayed underground in the dragon pit until the common people left maybe uh, and you know i mean rainies did know that there were thousands of people above her in the dragon pit like she was standing in the audience um she was standing right next to those people before she burst up and killed some of them um i feel like rainies could have you know tried to avoid killing those people it, it also is weird like what isn't there a ramp like previously when we've seen the dragon pit uh, there is, there's this ramp that the dragons come up from. See, see over here. Um, but it looks like the greens, like, cover over those ramps. They must put some, like, boards, I suppose, over the ramp. And so the beast bursts up from below the boards. So, like, I, I guess that ramp, I mean, maybe that ramp is the only exit from the dragon pit. And maybe Rainy's had to burst through one way or another. Um... But yeah, I feel like she could have tried to avoid killing those people. Uh, Andre asks about the dragon that Daemon went to see. That is Vermithor, the Bronze Fury, the dragon of uh, Jaehaerys, the king before Viserys. It is a powerful old dragon. The, The books say that dragons just like keep on growing as they grow older. Like dragons never stop growing. They just grow and grow and grow until they die. Um... And that's, you know, why Vagar is so monstrously huge. Uh, And so generally, the older dragons are more powerful. I mean, the older dragons are usually slower. 
Um, but they're also usually tougher because the books say that dragon scales get stronger and dragon scales like fuse together as the dragon gets older. So they become almost impervious to arrows and swords and fire. And like one of the only ways to f for a human to kill a big old dragon is with like a scorpion bolt to the eye if you're like really, really lucky. However, dragons can kill dragons, um, but the bigger ones have an advantage. Taylor says, My head canon is not that Vagar and Arax disobeyed Amond and Luke, but rather they were responding to the subconscious feelings of those two boys, who were not fully in control of their emotions. Yeah, I, I like that interpretation, because, you know, th these boys are teenagers who are learning how to deal with their feelings. There's a lot of testosterone going on, a lot of fear, um, and despite Amon's words, you know, and despite Luke's words saying, like, telling the dragons not to fight, I think they might feel a desire to fight anyway, um, and the dragons might sense that. Because, yeah, like, th there are hints in the books that the dragons can sense the feelings of their writers, and they may be, you know, responding to the feelings of the writers as much or more than they are listening to the commands. Because if we use our brain, like, there's no way the dragons can hear the words of these kids during the buffeting storm. Like, especially with Vagar. Like, Vagar's hearing probably isn't so good at this point. She's probably got hearing aids. Um, and Vagar's ears are like, are like 50 meters away from Amon's mouth. Like, there's no way that they can actually hear the commands. It's got to be a psychic thing. I mean, look, here we are <laughs> speculating on the, on the science of dragons. It's magic. It doesn't matter. But, but yes, like, I agree with you, Taylor, that it, it may be like a psychic thing. And, 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 and that connects to what we were saying about, like, these are kids. These are teenagers. You should not give teenagers control of giant dragons. Thank you for the super chat from Jeffrey, who says, Would it not have been a better idea to send Rhaenys, who is the daughter of a Baratheon, to deliver the message to Storm's End? Yeah, that's a great idea. I think that definitely would have been smarter. Because uh, Boros might be a bit of a dick, but he at least um, he has more of a connection to Rhaenys than he does to Luke Valarion. Um, I think that Boros does say, though, uh, at, at some point in this chapter that, like, oh, Rainy Saint shit. I don't remember the exact wording, but I think Boros says in this chapter that, like, oh, yeah, like, we have a, you know, I have that cousin, but but whatever, I'm not, I don't really care about Rainy's that much. Maybe I'm misremembering, but I, I think, I think Boros says something like that. Oh, yeah, he said, all right, quote. Aye, Princess Rhaenys is kin to me and mine. Some great aunt I never knew was married to her father, but the both of them are dead. And Rhaenyra, she's not Rhaenys, is she? He had nothing against women, Lord Boros went on to say. He loved his girls. A daughter is a precious thing, but a son. Ah, Storm's End would pass to his son, not to his sisters. So, so yeah, in the books, Boros does talk about Rhaenys, and he's like, ah, she's like you know, a cousin, whatever, like, I'm not that interested. So, yeah, M maybe even sending Rainies might not have helped. Thanks for the super chat from Daniel, who says, I really appreciate how the dragons have real personalities in Game of Thrones. In Game of Thrones, they felt like magic jets that could intuit direction, but here they seem like nuclear dogs. I love that description, Daniel. Nuclear dogs. I agree. They have all of the they have all of the personality and loyalty and danger and and rabidity of 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 a dog. Lots of different colors and and shapes and sizes. Uh, but they also happen to have <laughs> thermonuclear firepower. Yeah, I, I like that description. Uh, and yeah, like like in Game of Thrones, it sucked because Viserion and Rhaegal and Drogon were all almost identical shades of murky brown most of the time. Uh, whereas in Hot D, the dragons are all different colours, as they are described in the books, different colours. And they have different, like, shapes and, and, and sizes, and Caraxes is a freaky noodle neck, and um, and it's wonderful. And vegar has got a big f flibbity, gouty neck jangling around, which is also really fun. I loved the sounds that Rhaenyra's dragon Cyrax made in this episode. Lots of squawky sounds. The, the dragons sound a bit like birds. And and I mean, you know, like birds are uh, dinosaurs technically, aren't they? Or dinosaurs are birds. 
dinosaurs technically they say non-avian dinosaurs now i don't know but in in the real world that you know there's a connection between birds and, and reptiles and dinosaurs and i and i like how the sort of squawking dragon sounds sort of evoke that bird-like nature so yeah they're like birds they're dogs uh, they're, they're wonderful uh, the dragons are much better in hot d than they were in game of thrones and we're going to see a whole lot more of them later on yeah caraxes the spicy noodle the danger noodle noodle danger sky dog lots of good descriptions in the live chat <laughs> thanks for the super chat from hunter who says uh i think this set up a nice potential revenge fight with jace and amond even though i think only daemon or Arik could beat him in combat yeah it does seem like amond is one of I mean, I mean, I mean, Amond has Vega, the most powerful weapon of war in the world. But even without Vega, uh, Amond appears to be a powerful warrior. And the books say that Kristen trained Amond to be a powerful warrior. So yeah, I mean, Daemon is definitely one of the most powerful warriors. So maybe, maybe Daemon could defeat Amond. I mean, a I mean, Daemon has a lot of experience of actual war from his years on the Stepstones. Whereas Amond has no experience of actual war. He only has training, so... And, you know, like, Daemon is older and bigger. Amond is, you know, maybe not fully grown. So, yeah, I, I reckon Amon, I reckon Daemon would have a good chance of defeating Amond in combat. But we'll just have to see, won't we? Shane says, Who do you think Vermithor's rider will be? Uh, well, I think one possibility is Rainer Targaryen. That they they there was a shot of Rainer's face when um when they talked about the wild dragons on Dragonstone who might be claimed, um because you know we learned in Pentos that Rainer feels left out that you know her twin sister Baylor has a dragon called Moon Dancer, a young dragon, uh, whereas Rainer's dragon egg never hatched, and so Rainer is hopeful that she might uh, be able to claim a dragon at some point. So yeah, in theory, Rainer could claim Vermithor. Or Silverwing, or maybe maybe Sea Smoke. Lots lots of options, and there are those wild dragons as well. So, yeah, maybe Rainer will will do it. In in the books, they actually mention that Rainer uh, Rainer's dragon egg did hatch in the books, but it was like a deformed weakling dragon hatchling that that soon died. Um, so, so slight difference in the books. Thanks for the super chat from... Oh, well, and yeah, and to talk a little more about the dragon claiming thing. Um, you need Targaryen blood to claim a dragon, or at least Valyrian blood. Um, and so the reason why, you know, Baylor and Rhaena uh, have Targaryen blood from Daemon, and Jace, Luke, and Joff have Targaryen blood from Rhaenyra... Um, so, you know, th they can't just strap Eric Cargill to the Bronze Fury and expect it to work. Um... But, you know, since they have all these dragons, they have more dragons than riders. Uh, we're going to have to figure out how to use those dragons, aren't we? So that might be a plot point later on. Thanks for the super chat from Jess, who says, Imagine if Vagar was still around during the time of Daeron. Oh, Visenya, is that a bunch of Dornish snacks in the city? Yeah, because Daeron II married a, a Dornish woman and uh, facilitated the the uniting of the kingdom. Um, and Vega is, Vega's probably a bit racist, if we're honest. <laughs> Vega is probably a racist old grandma because, uh, because Vega, oh fuck, because Vega participated in, uh, the attacks on Dawn by Aegon and Visenya, so... I, I mean, that's that's a thing in the books, is that, you know, a lot of people uh, are prejudiced against Dornish people because of the years of war. And so when Daeron intermarried with the Dornish, some people uh, were prejudiced against uh, him and his wife because of that. So that that's a whole... that's a whole thing. Patrick says, The dragon also saw the passing of all the dragons she knew. Yeah, I mean, there could be a generational gap between Vega and the other dragons. Like, you know, we don't know how much dragons, you know, how intelligent dragons are, how much memory they have. But yeah, I mean, Vega probably misses her egg siblings, you know, Beleriand and Meraxes. Like, Vega is the last of her generation, um, and she might not, she might not be pals with this new younger generation of. Um, this new younger generation of dragons, so maybe that's another gap. 
That's Vision. Happy to find the YouTube channel. Big shout out from Norway. Thanks, Vision. Majid says, following the tradition of a shocking episode 9, I feel like this episode should have been the 9th, and the 10th would have been the reaction or consequence. Yeah, I, I guess, you know, th traditionally the 9th is like a big battle episode or whatever in Game of Thrones. Um, but I guess, yeah, like, I mean, Luke's death in this episode is more shocking than anything happened in the previous episode, episode 9. I, I mean, I, they, they don't need to fit that pattern every time. Like, I I think that part of why they added, like, Rainey's bursting up on Melis at the Dragon Pit to episode 9, which isn't in the books, I think they did that partly because they felt like they needed a big climactic violent moment um, in episode 9. I, I would have been just as happy if they didn't have it. I thought Aegon's coronation was great as, as like a climax for that episode. I don't I don't know if they needed to add the Rainies thing. Um, so yeah, I don't know. Thanks, Natalie, who says I think Luke's death was showing us that Viserys was right when he said that Targaryens don't really control their dragons. Yeah, we've, I mean we've already discussed that. I think that um that definitely is foreshadowing from Viserys. There, they're laying the groundwork for this issue. And it's good that they also had, like, they also had the dragon lessons scenes, um, which was also, like, you know, like, one of the dragon keepers was was telling Jace, like, you, you've got to control your dragon, you've got to do a, do a better job of controlling your dragon, so that that has been an issue in Hot D for a while, and, and now it's paying off. And it ties into that whole, like, you know, playing with fire, playing with power, destruction, magic, like, it's all about the dangers of ambition, the dangers of dreams, like, like, they, they talk about dragon dreams, because dragons are connected to dreams of freedom, dreams of power, dreams of, you know, ego and desire, that's what dragons are, so, the, all, all of these stories are about the, um, dangers of those things. Uh, yeah, we discussed, uh, Maris negging Amond into attacking Luke, we discussed Rhaenys, Race says, wild to see the children experience the same conflict inertia between them and the dragons as the adults witnessed their children in episode 8. That is a good point, Race. I agree. Um, because the whole thing in episode 8 um, was that Rhaenyra and Alicent were trying to make peace. But their children, Amond and Jace and Luke and Aegon, did not get the memo. Um, Alicent and Rhaenyra, you know, they're old, they're mature. They are seeing Viserys die before their eyes, and so they are wise enough to say, okay, we've got to stop this conflict. But Amond and Aegon and Jason Luke, the teenagers full of testosterone and, and uh, what was that Rainy's line? Uh, full of the, the, the steel in their fists and seed in their loins, whatever it was that Rainy said. Um, the kids continued the fight, even when the adults tried to stop it. Conflict inertia, indeed. Um, and we have a really similar thing in this episode where Luke and Amond are trying to stop this conflict, or at least, you know, they're, they're trying not to kill each other. They're trying to, like, pull back at this point. But then the dragons just continue. They carry the inertia of the conflict and the dragons don't obey. So, yeah, I, I think that's a great point. The dragons... The, the, the conflict is passed on and passed on and passed on generation after generation, and that even gets passed down to the dragons. It's like a conflict has a life of its own, like hate has a life of its own. Um, and even when the individuals try to stop it, uh, the, the the force and the feeling itself continues. Um, th th there is this sense of like inevitable tragic fate being against them um, and everyone just being carried along in this tide, this wave of violence that is sweeping them all up and uh, it's going to lead to bad times. Thanks for the super chat from Eric, who says, what if Lenor Valerion comes back, pretending to be a Targaryen bastard? Fun, fun ideas, interesting ideas. I mean, again, like, Lenor surviving is not in the books, um, but, you know, there are potential things they could do with the character. Um, what are some other things that I wanted to say? Um... Serving the kingdom. Oh, yeah, I thought it was interesting that, like, when Rhaenyra sent Jace and Luke out to visit the other houses, she, she made this comment about, like, she, she made this weird comment about uh, the Targaryens are closer to gods than to men, 
she tells her children, which is a weird thing to tell your child. Don't tell your child that your child is a god. But she says, we are closer to gods than men. The Iron Throne puts us a touch closer, but if we are to serve the Seven Kingdoms, we must answer to their gods. And so then Rhaenyra uh, makes Jace and Luke swear on the Seven-Pointed Star, which is the holy book of the Faith of the Seven. So Rhaenyra is saying, like, we don't believe in the Seven, really, uh, but we're going to pretend that we care about the Faith of the Seven, because most of Westeros follows the Faith of the Seven, and if we want to rule them, we need to follow their religion. And that's something that Aegon the Conqueror uh, did early on in his conquest. Like, the, the Targaryens and the Valyrians historically have not been very interested in religion, but they pretend to be for political reasons. So I thought that was an interesting thing for them to highlight. And, you know, you know that, that also contrasts with, like, the Hightowers and the Greens have a very enthusiastic embrace of the Faith of the Seven, which is a bit, which is a bit more sincere, I think. Although, of course, ironically, like, Alicent is wearing the Star of the Faith of the Seven, and Alicent is talking about religion um, at the same time that she's, you know, getting Laris to masturbate off her feet, and Kristen is murdering people. And I don't think the Seven-Pointed Star has any verses about... Um, foot masturbation so yeah religion playing a role is important politically um they mentioned the dragon keepers could join the conflict like daemon mentioned that like you know we've got to like work with what we've got militarily so daemon says that uh we you know we should put some soldiers around the perimeter of dragon stone so that, that we look like we have more soldiers than we actually do and yeah, he mentions that the Dragon Keepers are good fighters. Because uh, the Dragon Keepers in the books are described as like this... Um, a bunch of guards with like fancy, ornate dragon armor. And the Dragon Keepers do seem to be like badass, cool fighters in the books. So they may be relevant, which is cool. I'm, I'm, I'm happy with what they've done with the Dragon Keepers. Um, <laughs> I liked when Rhaenyra first found out um, that Aegon has been crowned as king uh Rhaenyra's reaction was uh him they cr they crowned him it reminds me like you know in Arrested Development when they're like her she her him really Aegon that motherfucker they made him king why um and yeah we talked about how Rhaenyra in the books well during labor her labor went for three days and she was like crying curses against Alicent Rhaenyra is much more aggressive much less peaceful in the books uh her stillborn baby was named Visenya um we mentioned Lord Keltigar I thought it was a, an interesting scene where Daemon went and took these two kings guard and like threatened them with his dragon Caraxes, he like tells Jace, "I will show you the meaning of loyalty," and he like threatens those Kingsguard. Um, I thought that was an an odd thing to do, but I mean, the Kingsguard are of um, questionable loyalty at this point, I suppose, because like Eric left the Greens and Harold left the Greens, and um, it's not entirely clear whose side the Kingsguard is on. Like the Kingsguard is not normally split like this, but, but that's the situation here. And so Daemon, like, intimidates the King's Guard and threatens to make them die painfully, which is like, all right, Daemon. Like, he's obviously expressing his grief and his how upset he is by, you know, threatening violence, as Daemon does. Um, but, you know, it sort of emphasizes the question of, like, who are the King's Guard loyal to? Um, we talked about, yeah, I thought it was funny that, like, Otto, when he's offering the peace terms, he's like, ah, Aegon, in his wisdom, has decided to offer you peace, when, you know, Aegon, Aegon's wisdom has nothing to do with it, it was Alicent who wants to offer peace. I almost wonder if Otto, <sighs> I feel like Otto could have done a better job of convincing Rhaenyra to make peace, you know? And, and I feel like Otto not being there would have been the first decision. Like, the, the, the a good way to make Rhaenyra agree would have been, you know, sending Alicent or someone instead of Otto. But, you know, I guess Otto does sincerely want Rhaenyra to submit, you know, even if he hopes to murder Rhaenyra at some point. But, yeah, I feel like he could have done a better job with that peace offer. Um... I thought, yeah, I thought it was interesting, like, that Otto said that Viserys, like, Viserys and Rhaenyra were the last people to see it. 
that Aegon is heir. As soon as Aegon was born, Aegon was heir, Otto says. Like, Otto says that Rhaenyra was kidding herself if she thought she was heir. And, like, the, the son, the eldest son, is always the heir. Um, and the fact that Otto says, you, you and Viserys were the last people to see it. Like, Otto is admitting there that he was going against Viserys' wishes by plotting to support Aegon. Like, Otto is, like, low-key almost admitting to treason by saying that I was supporting Aegon even when Viserys didn't realize it, you know? Um, Otto's being very bold with these words there. Uh, in the books, Rhaenyra unchains Orwile. Like, Orwile is the Grand Maester, uh, and in the books, Rhaenyra says, Orwile, you're no bloody Grand Maester, you're supporting the illegitimate Greens and the illegitimate Aegon, so... Uh, Rhaenyra actually tears off Orwile's uh, maester chain in the books and appoints her own grand maester in the books. It's a shame that they cut that. That was fun in the books. I thought it was also very funny that uh, Rhaenyra told Luke, I expect you'll receive a very warm welcome at Storm's End. Uh, and when, you know, Luke was killed by the dragon Vagar, I suppose he experienced a very warm welcome indeed. Thanks for the super chat from Lewis, who says the premiere of the show had the death of two Targaryens and the finale ended with the death of two Targaryens. It's like poetry, it rhymes. Yeah, Emma and Balon died in the, in the premiere episode and now the stillborn Visenya and Luke died. So yeah, two deaths. And I think that that is most relevant to Rhaenyra, I think, because it sort of mirrors how, in episode one, Viserys lost his wife Emma and lost his baby Balon, and that sort of defined his reign from then on. And I think the fact that Rhaenyra has lost her child Luke and lost her stillborn Visenya, I think that is going to define her reign. So yeah, I think that is a um, parallel in a lot of ways. Rabid Chu says, I like it's I like that it's actually the dragons that kick off the conflict. Amond is responsible, but yeah. Yeah, the, the it, yeah, I mean it, it connects to what Viserys was saying about like dragons destroyed Valyria. Like it's it's toying with power itself that leads to the conflict. Abby says, Storms and Aesthetics was a glimpse of what Westeros will was before the conquest which the lore alone is fascinating. Yeah, that's a good point, because, like, a lot of these big castles around Westeros are absurdly huge. Like, there are all these monuments. Like, there's the High Tower, there's the Wall, there's Storm's End, there's Winterfell, there's Moat Caelan, the ruins of Moat Caelan. There's all these, like, enormous castles around, which seem much bigger and much more advanced than anything that is built now. So it seems like Westeros has gone backwards technologically, like, like, there used to be more powerful stuff around. There was, like, some golden age, the age of heroes that has now declined. Um, it may be that those structures were built with the aid of magic to some extent. Like, Brandon the Builder, the legendary Brandon the Builder may have been involved. There are magical wards in Storm's End. So, yeah, I mean, maybe the Long Night, the apocalypse of the Long Night may have been what caused that backward slide in technology. Maybe it's a post-apocalyptic world that we're living in, Westeros. So, and you know, like those monuments of past glory are a reminder of the dangers of downfall, you know? Like, it's possible that we all can be reduced from our former glory. It's a warning not to be too arrogant, but I'm not sure if the Targaryens are listening. And so, some of what I just said was more speculation than actual law, but that's the sense that I get from it anyway. Uh, Sasha says, I thought Storm's End looks lame. A tall tower doesn't bode well in stormy seas. Yeah, well, I'm not sure about the structural integrity um, of that tower, but I, I like the symbolism of, like, it's described in the books as, like, a fist being directed at the sky, like a fuck you to the gods. Um... I would have liked to have seen a bit more of the, like, the big stone drum at the base of it. Yeah, I mean, it, it does look more like a big-ass tower here in Hot D, whereas in the books it, it's more of, like, a castle that has a tower as part of it. 
I mean, and the walls, like, it's it's meant to emphasize the walls in the book. And we don't see a whole lot of the walls. And, you know, it does look kind of precarious the way that it's, like, perched on this rock out thrust into the sea. So, yeah, it's not exactly how it's described in the books, but I still think it looks cool. Cat says, I love the parallel between the standoffs in Dragonstone, between Otto and Daemon, in episode 2 and episode 10. Yeah, it was it was quite a similar series of events that happened here compared to when Daemon um, took over Dragonstone. Just this time, Rhaenyra is on Daemon's side instead of Otto's side. I guess things have changed, huh? I mean, Daemon, I mean, it's funny that all these years later, Daemon's reaction is exactly the same, which is Daemon just wants to fucking kill Otto and, and Daemon draws his sword. Um, so it doesn't seem like Daemon has changed very much, but Rhaenyra has changed very much indeed. Thanks for the super chat from Charles. Tuning in every week, love the streams. Would love to know who your favourite character was this season. I mean, I, I think Viserys is a great performance by Paddy Considine. There's just a lot of layers to Viserys. Um, I really enjoyed him. Um, you know, Kristen, I think, is interesting. I think Alicent is really interesting. Um, she's managed to be, like, really sympathetic and also horrible at the same time. Um, I think Laris steals every scene that he's in. I think that Laris is, it perfectly captures the clubfoot, uh, as described in the books. He's, he's so mysterious and, and nasty and intriguing all at once. And, and, and Matt Smith is, is enormously charismatic as Damon. Like, like, you know, I was... Uh, skeptical about Matt Smith um, being Daemon at first, but I, I think he totally owns it. I, I think he totally captures Daemon. So, um, so yeah, a lot of good performances. Seeker says, uh, well, Seeker mentions the cannibal. Yeah, we won't spoil anything, but but there is a wild dragon called the cannibal, who is uh, pretty cool, pretty fun. Might might see him later. Hector says, it would be cool if there was a confrontation between an ice dragon and a normal one. Yeah, I mean, we don't know if ice dragons exist, really. Like, the law mentions that there are these um, ice dragon fellas um, who, like, breathe ice. But it's possible that those are just, like, a legend. Like, barely anyone has, like, seen an ice dragon. It might be more of, like, a metaphor for, like, the cold winds around the frozen seas of the north or whatever but uh yeah they're cool it's a nice little bit of world building i wouldn't expect to see an ice dragon like turn up anytime soon i mean george did also write like a children's book called the ice dragon and i think i haven't read it but i think there's some some people have some idea about like the ice dragon melts and then the melted dragon forms the pool of water in the winterfell godswood i think that's an idea that people like um, so that's fun, but uh, yeah, look, maybe maybe we'll we'll find out some more when um, when Jace flies his dragon up to Winterfell. It's always interesting when a dragon is in the north. Doesn't happen too often. Always interesting when ice and fire combines. Zeva Panda says, "I love how Otto tells Rhaenyra exactly what houses have not pledged their allegiance to Aegon." Yeah, what was it like the Tyrells uh, and the Lannisters? And the Tullys, did he mention the Tullys? The Tullys, I think, are disputed. But yeah, I mean, I guess everyone wants to claim what power they have. Uh, Ring says, yeah, we kind of talked about that. Wealthwolf says, is Alt-Shift-X a legitimized bastard of Alt-Shift-X, or is it more of a Karstark situation? I think it's more of a Skargos situation. Alt-Shift-X is the cannibal island. Uh, Trash says, Otto started all of this. If he hadn't pushed Alicent, none of this tragedy would have happened. I mean, yes, and it's all Viserys' fault. Because Viserys chose to marry Alicent and chose to have children with Alicent. And that, if that didn't happen, then the conflict wouldn't have happened. And the reason why Viserys married Alicent is because he was horny for this teenager. Um, if he didn't do that selfish... Uh, morally questionable marriage, then there never would have been this issue. And, you know, also Viserys um, failed to adequately 
you know, make it real clear and indisputable that Rhaenyra was his heir. I mean, really, he should have considered marrying Aegon to Rhaenyra. I mean, yes, there's a huge age gap and it would have been gross and weird, but, like, if Aegon was married to Rhaenyra, none of this would be happening either, you know? Like, let, there's just a lot of different choices the Viserys could have made to prevent this conflict, and he took none of them. <laughs> And yes, he made his heroic walk uh, in the end, but it was too little too late. So, you know, you can blame Otto, you can blame Viserys, you can blame Alicent, you can blame Rhaenyra, you can blame a lot of people for this conflict. And I think the show very deliberately makes it clear that, you know, that there's no one answer, there's no one villain, there's a lot of very complicated reasons for this conflict. And um, no one's innocent. No one's innocent. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Julian, who says, The Cat Spore Dagger is Lightbringer. It makes too much sense as a classic George Martin twist. Everyone's expecting Dawn or something, but turns out to be this little dagger. What, what, what if the Cat Spore Dagger is like a shard of the original Lightbringer? Like, we know that Valyrian steel can be melted down, like ice is melted down into... Oathkeeper and Widow's Whale, so maybe Catspaw is like a piece of the original Lightbringer. That would be cool. Tanya says, can dragons go to war without a rider? Danny went around everywhere with three of hers. Can a rider not claim more than one? Yeah, so in the books, Daenerys is, is bonded to Drogon. Like, Drogon is the only dragon that Daenerys rides. Um, and in the show, like, Viserion and Rhaegal seem to, like, follow Daenerys's lead and, um, and follow her orders, but, like, the book's not so much. Like, it, it's, it's not super clear exactly how the dragon connection works, but a dragon rider can only claim one dragon for life, um, as far as we know. Um, and we do see dragons in war, without riders sometimes, but they're not really controllable. Like, you kind of need a rider in order to control a dragon. And as we saw this episode, even when you do have a rider on a dragon, sometimes they are still not controllable. So, so yeah, I mean, it, it could be an option to let loose some dragons that don't have riders, but that might be a very dangerous thing to do. Um, there's no guarantee that the dragon is going to attack who you want them to attack if they don't have a rider. But yeah, th those th that's a good there are those sort of questions are all going to be relevant as the story goes on. Uh Red Salt compares Vega burning dawn to the US invasion of Iraq. Uh Jarek asks are the green and black parents sharpening their kids claws to fight in the pits of war? Ah, that's a great point, Jarek. Yeah, so I mean, you know, th this is, this show's all about the parents pushing their kids into the parents' conflict um, and how messed up that is. And yeah, that's a great point that just as those children in those slave fighting pits were being pushed in to fight each other and armed and prepared to fight each other, uh, in a way, th these noble royal parents are doing the same thing with Jace and Luke and Joff and with Aegon and Aemond. They're sharpening their teeth by giving them swords and giving them dragons and they're pushing them into the fighting pit by by you know pitting them against each other in this conflict so yeah it's a great point jarek i think those child fighting pits can be seen as an analogy for this this whole conflict writ large um abyssal says seeing vega should be a sign to quickly nope out yeah, when Luke first arrived at Storm's End and, and saw Vega already at Storm's End, good time to run away, for sure. But, you know, Luke w was trying to be brave, and, you know, in this world, like, you know, reputation is so much, like, people would have mocked him if he, like, turned up but then turned tail, if he just ran away. Uh, and, you know, he, he, he had been entrusted with this mission by his mother, so he tried to saw it through. Tried to see it through, and he and he died for it. Thanks for the super chat from Christopher, who says the storm at Storm's End was beautiful. Yeah, I thought it looked lovely. A, a similar storm in in Stormbreaker Bay, as it's called, uh, killed Robert Renly and Stannis Baratheon's parents, um, Stefan Baratheon, and um, what's her name? a turtle lady who who died in a storm while they were coming in on a ship 
So there's a long history of those storms and storms causing a ruckus. Uh, we've talked about how in the books uh, it appears that Amond was in control of his dragon in the books. Um, Rachel says, have we talked about Daemon choking Rhaenyra? We have. Um, I think that I think that it's pretty consistent. I think that Daemon has hurt innocent people a lot of times um, when he's feeling emotional, and so I'm not shocked that he's violent to his wife. He has always been a dickhead. Um, you know, I mean, he, he, he's he been horrible to Viserys as well in the past. Um, I don't, like, we've been told that Daemon has no limit, Alicent said. Daemon has no limit, and I think that she's correct. Daemon, when he's emotional, uh, he hurts people, and, and that's what happens here. And he's and he's in a particularly emotional state with the death of Viserys and with, you know, Alicent crowning Aegon and so on. So, yeah, Daemon's not a good guy. JW says, I'm not convinced that this show needed to be made. Never did it actually come close to the vast and impactful story I was reading in Fire and Blood. Um, Yeah, well, your mileage may vary. I like... House of the Dragon more than I like Fire and Blood. Fire and Blood is is a very sparse plot summary, whereas Hot D has has all the detail and and the drama and the emotion and the dialogue. Um, and you know you might imagine um, your own idea of the details from reading Fire and Blood. I mean that that's part of what Fire and Blood does is that it it sparks your imagination. Like it it just gives you a vague idea of what happened, and then you have to imagine the details in Fire and Blood. So, I mean, it's apples and oranges, really. Like, Fire and Blood and House of the Dragon are just two very different things. It's amazing how House House of the Dragon is very faithful to Fire and Blood. Like, very... Like, like mostly, House of the Dragon does not contradict Fire and Blood, except for a few important details. Um, and it's interesting how it manages to be so faithful, but also manages to sort of diverge and, and deepen it in a lot of ways. Thanks for the super chat from Pedro, who says, Daemon losing his, losing his temper and strangling Rhaenyra reminded me of Awakening the Dragon and Danny's brother Viserys. How common are these impulse control issues in male Targaryens? Yeah, um, that's a good point. Uh, Viserys was, was horrible and violent towards his sister Daenerys. And yeah, it, it is pretty common among Targaryens. I mean, I'm reminded of Aerion Targaryen. Um, who was a very unpleasant Targaryen prince um, who ended up going mad and drinking wildfire in the belief that it would transform him into a dragon. But uh, yeah, there there are a lot of examples of Targaryens who are violent and delusional and, and hurt the people around them. Um, the idea of Targaryen madness comes up a lot and um, we could debate all day if Daemon is going mad. Is that something that could happen? Ooh. Uh, so yeah, it's not uncommon, and I mean, you know, we can attribute that partly to the blood of the dragon that's in them, the fire in their blood. We can attribute that to the uh, generations of incest, uh, maybe scrambling their brains a bit. We can attribute that also to just too much power in one man's hands, like making someone a prince. I mean, what does that do to your ego? What does that do to your moral compass? Um, sometimes princes are dicks because they have too much power and too much ego. So I think all of those things contribute. Um, but also, you know, the, of, of course, it comes down to personal responsibility and personal choices, and um, sometimes Daemon makes really bad ones. Thanks for the super chat from Sasha. Oh, we did that one. Um, we talked about that one. And Jal says, Jal says, I feel like Daemon choking Rhaenyra is similar to Laris's feet thing because it shows the power they hold over the queens. Yeah, I mean, I guess I guess you could say that, like, you know, no matter how powerful these women are, um, the men in their life are still stronger than them, and there's just, like, an inherent power imbalance between men and women, regardless of what their titles are and regardless of what their hierarchies are. So that's an element as well, I suppose. Thanks for the super chat from Late and from Taylor who says, this stream has become part of my Sunday schedule, we'll miss it, and this community. Thank you for your work and insight. Thank you, Taylor. I'm very grateful for all of you coming and joining in every week. This has been really fun. Uh, I, th I think we're going to wrap this stream up shortly. Um, 
I'll go and try and answer as many of your questions as I can before we wrap it up. Um, but yeah, it's been a pleasure. Thank you, everybody, for the support. Um, thanks so much for watching. Um, it's been fun. I'm gl I'm glad the show was good. <laughs> It's not a perfect show, but but uh, it's it's given us a lot to talk about and a lot to think about. And um, looking forward to making more House of the Dragon as it comes out, and more Game of Thrones and Song of Ice and Fire stuff. And uh, yeah, it's been real. All right, we'll uh, try and answer um, your questions, and then we'll wrap it up pretty shortly. John says. Maybe the dragons influence the writers. Yeah, I mean, one question for me is like, what what exactly was Viserys's relationship to Beleriand? Like, we keep seeing Beleriand's skull in Hot D, and we've seen Viserys, you know, gazing up at Beleriand while he's talking about how dragons are dangerous and can't be controlled. So it sounds like you know maybe Viserys had a bad experience with Beleriand, and maybe Viserys you know, failed to control Beleriand. And, and that makes sense, you know, like, it seems as though Vagar is hard for Amont to control because Vagar is so old and powerful and, and strong-willed. So, you know, Beleriand was even bigger and even older and even stronger, so, you know, and, and Viserys was young at the time, so maybe something really scary happened to Viserys when he was riding Beleriand. It would be cool if we find out about it. Like, maybe Viserys told Daemon, and maybe Daemon could reveal this in a later season. Like, ooh, yeah, Viserys told me he flew Beleriand, and he almost died, you know? Like, Beleriand almost killed someone. Like, whoa, it was a really traumatic moment. That would be cool. Um, and yeah, maybe dragons influenced their riders. Like, maybe Viserys was scared, because, you know, in some kind of psychic connection that may or may not exist between the dragons and the riders, maybe Daemon... Sorry, maybe Viserys sensed all of the death and destruction that Beleriand has caused. All of the wars, all of the battles, all of the horror, all of the charred corpses. And maybe that just freaked Viserys out. And he's like, I don't want any part of this, you know? So yeah, those are all valid questions. Jack says, what is Aegon's opinion of Rhaenyra? Well, previously, I mean, we saw Aegon say to Alicent, like, oh, like... What what kind of brother would I be if I stole Rhaenyra's throne? He says something like that in in this scene and in the books, um, and in the books, like yeah, like like Aegon really needs some convincing to accept the crown, partly because he he doesn't think it's right for him to steal Rhaenyra's throne. So so yeah, like like Aegon does not hate Rhaenyra. Like we we don't see much of a relationship between them, but I think that's part of the tragedy of this whole conflict is that the rival claimants they don't even hate each other like Aegon and Rhaenyra don't even hate each other but they are the figureheads in this conflict that is really more about Hightower ambition and Targaryen ambition and and all these other issues so um yeah it'll be I mean that's the other thing like like if Alicent and Rhaenyra just sat down and had a conversation or if Aegon and Rhaenyra just sat down and had a conversation maybe they could sort it out Although I think at this point, like, now that they have crowned Aegon, and now that Aegon has experienced the joys of, of the adulation of the common folk, um, I, I think that Aegon does not want to let go of the crown now. I think it might be too late at this point, because once you put a crown on a beast, you can't uncrown him. One-Eyed Crow says that Otto arrives on Dragonstone under a three-headed green dragon, not golden. Yeah, so in the books, Aegon uses a golden dragon sigil to distinguish himself from the red Targaryen dragon used by Rhaenyra. Um, and yeah, it's interesting that they mentioned a green dragon um, in this episode, which I think makes sense. I mean, they've called Aegon and Alicent's faction the Greens, so I think it would be confusing to viewers if the Greens used a yellow dragon, you know? So... Um, so I, I would, I, I think it makes sense if the greens use a green dragon. I, I think that's fine. Um, I'm interested if they are ever going to call Rhaenyra's side the Blacks, um, because Rhaenyra's side is called the Blacks in the books, but they've never actually said that in the show so far. I wonder if they might change them to the, to the Reds or something. Um, because I wonder if they might be, uh, worried that people might hear the blacks and get the wrong impression about what that means. 
So yeah, I don't know, but uh, it, that'll be something to sort out in season two. Frankie says, why is Vega so ugly? Why are you so ugly, Frankie? Macy says, seems like the dragons can just sort their own beef, ignoring their writers. Is this in the books? It's uh, not, not really. No, it's not really in the books. I mean, dragons are hard to control, like, and if a dragon is pissed off, it will attack people. Like, I mean, yeah, dragons can act independently, yes. Um, but we've never quite seen something like this with, like, you know, Amon failing to control Vega and Vega just murking J Luke. Like, we haven't seen that in, um, we haven't seen that in the books. But it's plausible. It's plausible within the lore. Uh, we've talked about that Robbie says Bar Emin is an odd name, even by Westeros standards. What's up with that? Yeah, it mentioned House Bar Emin, which is a crowns, uh, crown lands um, house. And yeah, I don't know what the etymology is. There, there are a bunch of like kooky names for houses, which sometimes are references to silly things. Um, like there's, I think, House Jordan of the Tor. Yeah, here's the Tor, ruled by House Jordan, um, which is a reference to um, an author who is published by Tor Publishing. Like, George just named the house after one of his author buddies and a publishing company that he likes. Um, and there's a bunch of other examples. Like, There's, like, characters named after uh, football players. Um, there's Jordan is, is named after an author. Uh, there's a lot of there's a lot of funny little references in the house names and stuff sometimes. Uh, I mean, there's also a, there's also a Donald Trump reference in Fire and Blood actually. Um, so like in the book when they're describing the coronation of Aegon, they talk about oh you know the Dragon Pit had seating for you know this many thousands of people, uh, and the number of people who attended the coronation is a matter of some dispute. This maester says that 10,000 people came, but this other person says that 50,000 people came to the coronation, um, which appears to be a reference to the um, talk about different numbers of people who attended the inauguration of Donald Trump in 2016. So George Martin made a reference to that uh, in Fire and Blood, it appears. Which, uh, yeah. <laughs> Thanks, George. Thanks for the super chat from Red, who says, Weird question, but any idea what the Greyjoys are up to? The Greyjoys are up to classic Greyjoy shit, basically. Um, they are currently ruled by uh, Lord Dalton Greyjoy, who is called the Red Kraken, because uh, he sheds a lot of blood. So, um, yeah, the Greyjoys have been shedding some blood, and they may see an opportunity for more bloodshed in this conflict, so it will be cool to see how the Greyjoys get involved in Season 2. Uh, thanks for the super chat from Richard, who says, Whenever they announce the king or queen, they mention the Roinar. Why? Dawn hasn't joined the Seven Kingdoms yet. Yeah, it's true. But I think that's something that Aegon did ever since he landed, was he has been declaring himself the king of the continent, uh, because he believes in... Uh, <laughs> what's it called he believes in manifesting his desires you know if you say so if you say that you want a thing to be true enough it'll become true no um yeah they they, they want dawn to be part of the realm so they sort of act as though it is even though it's not i think that's basically the answer um thanks for the super chat from hunter and from raya and from cat who says Vega makes Amon genetically stronger by magic compared to Aegon? Uh, sure. Dylan says, "Are you okay with all of the changes from the books?" I I don't like the fact that Alicent misunderstood Viserys's words and thinks that Viserys wanted Aegon to be king. I I don't like that very much because it makes like a random misunderstanding co coincidence one of the major causes of the conflict, and I don't like that so much. I prefer when it's, like, decisions made by characters as opposed to accidental misunderstandings driving the story. Um, and I still am not, like, super on board with, like, Aegon's prophecy about the White Walkers being central to this conflict. Um, because I like it more when it's more about, like, personal human ambition, personal human emotions driving the story 
rather than highfalutin white walker nonsense but I, I guess you know that prophecy stuff is okay to the extent that it focuses more on the responsibility to be a good king and the responsibility to rule the realm well and i think that's I think that's really what Viserys is talking about when he talks about the prophecy. Because they never actually say White Walkers in Hot Day. They've only said, oh, there'll be a cold wind from the north and we must unite against the common enemy. And it's like, okay, like, you can see it more as a metaphor for let's not be shit, you know? And that I can respect. Mort says, if Amond didn't kill Luke, do you think Rhaenyra would have considered Otto's offer for the good of the realm? I think that's a good question, and I think maybe she would, because, yeah, like, Rhaenyra did say, like, I'll give you your answer on the morrow, you know? Like, Rhaenyra did not spit in Otto's face and say, no, I'm, I'm we're gonna fight a war for the throne, fuck you. No, she said, oh, I'll think about it. So, you know, but before she could give her answer, uh, she found out that Luke was killed, and, and now it looks like she's on a warpath. So, so, yeah, I mean, maybe tragically... Uh, it would have been okay if it wasn't for that death. If it wasn't for bloody Vega wanting a snack, maybe this conflict could have ended. But I mean, you know, that, that's true of so many events in this story. There have been so many moments that if they went differently, uh, things could have been okay. And I think that's that's the, the, the tragedy of it. Uh, Gunnar says that uh, Extreme Ways by Moby plays in the background when Rhaenyra receives this news. Uh, Midnight says, do you think a Blackfire Rebellion TV series would work? Or is it more difficult than the Dance of the Dragons? Oh, well, I mean, there are no dragons in the Blackfire Rebellions, so that means that the CGI budget would be significantly cheaper. Um, I, I, I think that the issue with a Blackfire show is that the Duncan Egg books are not finished yet, and the Duncan Egg books... Uh, are meant to cover that time period, but George has only written three of the ten-ish stories that he intends to write. So, um, I think that the Blackfire Rebellions could be really cool, but I think that George should finish the books first. Snagged says, Does Rhaenyra think her being queen is worth a war? Yeah, well, I think that that is what she is thinking about all throughout this episode. Um, and her hope is to be queen without fighting a war. That's what she wants. Um, and I, I, it's interesting throughout this episode how, you know, Daemon and the men are plotting war and she's trying to pull back from war. So, yeah, like, I, I, I don't think Rhaenyra wants thousands of people to die in order for her to get the throne. Um, I think she might give up her crown if it meant averting a war if it was that simple but i think that it's not that simple and i think that now that luke is dead her feelings are going to change and she's going to be angrier koopy says do you think amond will tell everyone that he didn't mean to kill lucerus or will he act like he meant to i think he will act like he meant to lotus says do you think how valyrian steel is found from the old age could they use a dragon horn yeah, ancient Valyrian dragon horns, horns were used to control dragons in the past, apparently. Um, and Euron finds a dragon horn in the Game of Thrones books, apparently. Um, so, yeah, I mean, it's it's conceivable. It's conceivable that they might find a dragon horn in Hot D and use it to control dragons better, since they do have trouble controlling dragons. I mean, Euron claims that Dragonbinder can steal Daenerys' dragons, so, so, you know, the Greens, they are outnumbered dragon-wise. So if the Greens uh, took some of the Black's dragons, then they could uh, even the playing field. But, uh, yeah, the books don't mention any such thing. Nicole says, why did Rhaenyra think that Daemon knew about the Song of Ice and Fire? Yeah, I thought that was a little weird. Um, like, Viserys said that, like, this is passed down from king to heir. Like, he was... But, but I mean, well, that's the thing. Like, Daemon was um, Viserys' heir until the birth of Rhaenyra. Uh, but Viserys chose not to tell Daemon. So, yeah, maybe Rhaenyra assumed that since Daemon was Viserys' heir before Rhaenyra was born, then maybe she assumed that Daemon must know. But it's weird that, you know, da Rhaenyra has known about this for years and she never brought it up with Daemon. She just assumed that he already knew. Like, like what? That's kind of weird. That's kind of weird the way that they framed that. But but I think that they framed it in such a way to highlight the shock and betrayal that Daemon feels. 
to find that his brother, Viserys, didn't trust him. Sasha says that the change making Alicent misunderstand Viserys' wishes is a way to make her less villainous. Yeah, I think that one of the, the biggest changes that they've made compared to the books is that they have made Rhaenyra and Alicent much more peaceful, much more sympathetic compared to in the books. But I imagine that might change as the story goes on. Uh, I, I think that, you know, this whole season has really been an origin story. This whole season has really been a prologue. Um, this is just setting the table and this is just introducing us to the characters and showing us why they feel the way they feel, you know, explaining their relationships, explaining their history so that when the shit hits the fan, we will, um, fully understand the weight of it. Thanks, No Face and Travis. Travis says, what is your biggest letdown of the season? Mmm, um... That's an interesting question. I I mean, I disliked it when Daemon did his, like, solo mission in the Stepstones and he, like, dodged all those arrows and, like, it, it really felt like a... It really felt like a Game of Thrones season, season 7, season 8 type thing. Like, I don't like the violence when it feels silly and, like, unrealistic. Like, he killed so many people and dodged so many arrows and it's like, okay, like the story, the violence has no weight if the characters have plot armor, you know? So, I did not enjoy that very much. Um, and yeah, I have mixed feelings about some of the changes, but yeah, I don't know, I'll have to think about it. Um, I think that we're going to wrap up this stream. I'm sorry that I haven't answered all of your questions, uh, but I've been talking for a few hours, so it's time to wrap it up. Guys, Thank you so much for being a part of this. Um, maybe we will do another live stream in a week or two, just to sort of consolidate any more thoughts that we have. Um, there will be the Explained video, the Season 1, Episode 10 Explained video will come out, uh, I think in a couple of weeks or a few weeks. We might take a bit more time for this next Explained video just to get it right. Doing the weekly schedule is um, nuts. It is, in fact, cuckoo bananas to make a 25 to 30 minute video essay every week. So um, I think we will take a little bit more time with this finale video. Um, and then we'll take a break. And then afterwards, we will get back to making some Song of Ice and Fire videos, making some Dune videos. The uh, Patreon supporters voted for a Jon Snow video called The Real Jon Snow. It's going to be similar to the real Tyrion Lannister video that we made, all about Jon Snow in the books and how it's different to Jon Snow in the show. And I think that video is going to be really cool. We're also going to make more Dune videos, uh, the philosophy of Dune about like the themes and ideas of Dune. That'll be really cool. When the second Dune movie comes out, we're going to do a real Dune Part 2 video. That's the plan. So there will be much more stuff coming, and uh, it wouldn't be possible without your support. So thank you all so much for watching uh, and supporting, and to the patrons and to the Super Chats, uh, you make it possible. So in the meantime... Um, the next explained video will be a few weeks away, so uh, in the meantime, you might like to check out some other House of the Dragon, Game of Thrones people. Um, Radio Westeros is really good. History of Westeros, the Nodacast podcast, Glidus, Joe Magician, Grey Area, Tony Teflon, In Deep Geek. There's a million really good channels uh, that you should check out and you should support. I want to thank Schubert Reads for moderating the live chat. I know that has not been an easy job. You might like to check out uh, Schubert Reads' YouTube channel for some readings of cool stuff. Uh, you might like to um, you might like to check out the Altshift ZZZ channel, which has like readings of stuff. You might like to follow the Altshift X podcast on Spotify. You can get all of these live streams as audio feeds. You can also get the Altshift X videos in an audio feed. Um, links in the description. Thank you for everyone supporting on Patreon. We're going to get back to the usual Patreon 
uh, early video access and the monthly patron-only live stream and all of that good stuff after we get back from a break. And uh, there's going to be lots of cool more stuff coming in. Uh, what else should we say? Is there anything else to say? I think we're done. Uh, it's been great. Thank you. Till next time.